good afternoon. I'm Kim Mallory. I'm the chair of the Department of Molecular Biology, Cell Biology, and Biochemistry. And on behalf of the MCB department, I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth annual Daniel Samuel M. Nabrit Conference for Early Career Scholars. I'd like to start by acknowledging that Brown University is located in Providence, Rhode Island on lands that are within the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Indian tribe. We acknowledge that beginning with colonization and continuing for centuries, the Narragansett have been dispossessed of most of their ancestral lands in Rhode Island by the actions of both individuals and institutions. We acknowledge our responsibility to understand and respond to these actions. The Narragansett Indian tribe, whose ancestors stewarded these lands with great care, continues as a sovereign nation today. We commit to working together to honor our past and build our future with truth. I'd like to next thank the following sponsors for their generous support of this conference. Brown's Program in Biology, the Office of the Provost, the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, the Graduate School, the Brown Center for Translational Neuroscience, the Brown Center for, on the Biology of Aging, and the MCB Department. Last, but by no means least, this conference would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of the organizing committee, which is chaired by Allison DeLong. The members of the committee are Melissa Aldana, Miles Bartholomew, Amy Cohen, Samra Cummings, Michelle Dawson, Phyllis Dennery, Mark Johnson, Carolina Mejia Pena, Kimberly Meza, Miles Mundy, Jessica Otis, Amanda Elisa Ruiz, Christoph Schorl, and Thomas Teich. To start things off, Committee member Miles Bartholomew is going to tell us about Dr. Samuel Nabrit and why we're celebrating his legacy, and then Dr. Phyllis Dennery will introduce our first keynote speaker. Miles is a PhD student in the MCB graduate program and an HHMI Gillian Fellow. Miles. So it is my honor um, to introduce Dr. Nabrit. I'm an accomplished marine biologist and distinguished international, uh, with a distinguished international career. Samuel Milton Abritt was born um, uh, in Macon, Georgia. He was Brown University's first uh, African-American PhD recipient and first African-American trustee. Um, in 1905, that was when he was born, he was a, born to a Baptist minister and teacher. Um, uh, Samuel Nabritt received his first degree um, in science from Morehouse College in 1925. Um, he immediately began teaching at Morehouse while working toward an advanced degree. Encouraged by Morehouse College President John um, Hope, a Brown alumnus, Nabrit applied to Brown University's doctoral program in biology. Despite his strong credentials, Nabrit's application was initially denied due to apprehensions within the small, close-knit department about racial tensions. Following a phone call from President Hope, Brown um, President William Fonts intervened on Nabrit's behalf. Nabrit went on to pursue a doctorate at Brown and conduct his um, doctoral research in marine biology at Marine Biological uh, Laboratories in Woodhull, Massachusetts. Um, there he studied the ability of fish to regenerate their fins after injury. Nabrit completed his degree and within three years um, went on to become an internationally acclaimed scholar for his research on animal regeneration. Since this time, Dr. Nabritt's scientific papers remain influential and are still cited today in journals including Regeneration, Mechanisms of Development, and Developmental Cell. Dr. Nabritt went on to serve as president of National Institute of Science in 1945, and in 1947, he became a member of the Marine Biological Laboratories uh, Corporation. This was um, the only, or only the second African-American uh, scientist to do so. Um, and he moved to Atlanta University, where he served as Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. In 1955, Dr. Nabritt became the second president of Texas Southern University in HBCU in Houston, Texas, and served in the role until 1966. In this role, he published several notable papers on the status and future of graduate and professional education for African Americans. Under U.S. President Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, Dr. Nabritt served in a number of national roles, including membership on the National Science Board and the Atom uh, Atomic Energy Commission, as well as a special ambassadorship. He was a founding member of the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, and in 1967, he became the executive director of the Southern Fellowship Fund, which supported African-American students pursuing doctoral degrees and post, uh, posts that he held um, until his retirement in 1981. 
Dr. Nabritt's contributions and achievements have been recognized uh, and remembered in several ways here at Brown University. He was awarded an honorary PsyD in 1962, and in 1987, he received the William Roger Award, which recognizes Brown alumni for outstanding humanitarian um, contributions. In 1999, a portrait of Dr. Nabritt was unveiled and added to the collection of portraits um, of important university leaders in Sales Hall here on campus. Since 1985, Nabritt Fellowships have uh, supported graduate students and more recently, undergraduate researchers um, from historically underrepresented groups. In 2005, Black Graduate Student Association adopted his name, becoming the Samuel M. Nabritt Black Graduate Student Association, loosely referred to uh, members as Nabritt. The association um, includes and welcomes all persons of African diaspora who are seeking um, advanced degrees here at Brown University and truly builds community. Um, the name was changed to better reflect the heritage and the pursuit of advanced degrees at um, Brown University for students of African descent. And as you see, we have many um, uh, great moments of fellowship um, and community through the organization. Dr. Nabritt truly has been and continues to inspire generations of students of color um, in their pursuit of advanced degrees. When I was doing my research on Dr. Nabritt, I found that his father was also a teacher and gave him some of his first science um, courses in physics, uh, Latin, et cetera. Um, and this helps remind me that we all stand on the shoulders of those that have come before us. Um, and the legacy and lineage is truly manifest in this room today um, as we celebrate and commemorate the phenomenal work that continues to be done. Thank you. That was very remarkable, all the things that Dr. Nabritt has done. Now we get to hear from another outstanding uh, scientist, uh, Alejandro Sanchez Alvarado, who is the Priscilla Wood Neves Endowed Chair in the Biomedical Sciences. Uh, he's um, originally from Venezuela and came to the U.S. to do his undergraduate studies. Uh, he went first to Vanderbilt, and then did his PhD at University of Cincinnati, where he was on a perinatology training grant, something that I care about as a neonatologist. And uh, he's uh, now the Stowers Institute Executive Director and Chief Scientific Officer, uh, as well as the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute um, Director in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, he has had so many um, honor, uh, honored speaker uh, engagements around the world and also honors, including the Vilsec Prize in Biomedical Sciences. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has 99 peer-reviewed publications in excellent, outstanding journals, including Science, Nature, Cell, PNAS, etc. The honors, the papers are too many to list, but they reflect his amazing science so far, and I'm sure much to come. The more uh, human aspect of uh, Dr. Alvarado is that he is also uh, a, an avid community member. He is on many boards in his own community. And he's also an avid reader and spends time doing things that bring passion, as we all should, to be well-rounded. So um, he also claims that his mentors have been the most instrumental in setting forth his career, and he has been paying, paying it forward ever since. We look very much forward to hearing your talk this, this afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for um, the uh, very kind and generous introduction, and uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's not often that um, um, I, I get to uh, partake in this type of uh, celebration where we're essentially celebrating a mentor, a mentor that is, um, has been a mentor even beyond his lifetime, as just Miles uh, um, described to us earlier. And it's also interesting, at least to me, that um, um, Dr. Nebrit was actually um, introduced to the world of life sciences and biology 
through regeneration. At a time when regeneration was really a big mystery, early 20th century, and that some of the work that he did uh, <clears throat> is actually on uh, caudal fin regeneration in fish, which, um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to conclude my presentation today by revisiting this topic and giving you some of the um, uh, work, uh, some of the results of the work that's been happening in, in my lab to try to understand regeneration. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you saw these images earlier with the two tails on, 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 on the left and right of the screen. Those are from uh, the Brits paper in the um, Biological Bulletin of the MBL, published in 1929. It's a beautiful body of work. Uh, it's a lot of clever amputation experiments that uh, it's the extent of the tools that were available. No confocal microscopy, no omics of any sort. All you had was your wits and what kinds of experiments you could execute with very simple tools, razor blades, tweezers, etc. And so those papers are a tour de force. I would say that any papers that are published in the life sciences from the late 1800s, uh, sometimes in the middle, but late 1800s to uh, right before World War I, are really mandatory reading for anybody who's interested in understanding the genesis of ideas in the field of developmental biology. And in the middle, it's just eye, uh, it's just eye candy. These are my worms eating color food, and it's just to keep your, your eyes on the screen, okay? <laughs> All right. I was also asked by Allison to give a little bit of background on my upbringing, so I think the best thing that I can do is uh, just show you where I was born and what kinds of things I was exposed to when I was growing up. So the very top is my city. This is the city where I, I was born. Um, and it's in a valley, and so at the north of those mountains is the Caribbean Ocean, and then to the south is just the city proper. My grandfather was a cattle rancher, so I used to spend my summers uh, in, in, in the ranch, supposedly working but I was more looking at things and, and getting more in trouble than anything else. And then I also had the opportunity to travel extensively with my dad and my uncle who were engineers across the expanse of, of uh, Venezuela. And this is one of my favorite places in Venezuela, which is the jungle of the, um, of the Amazonas. And that's pro that is the largest uh, waterfall in the world. And so I've been at the top, I've been at the bottom, I tried to climb it unsuccessfully, et cetera. But, um, but this is really what I think has shaped my understanding of the life sciences is that without knowing it growing up, I was exposed to a, a, something that we call biodiversity today, which to me was normal. But then when I came to the United States, I realized that um, this was not normal. And as the years got, began to proceed, I realized how abnormal this experience had been because it's really essentially cemented my idea of really trying to understand um, life and its uh, biological manifestations um, as broadly and as deeply as possible, right? And so what I'm gonna share with you for the rest of, of the hour is going to be examples of such an effort that's been carried out in my laboratory for the past 20 some years uh, in the hopes of us being able to understand what is it that makes regeneration in animals possible, okay? So I wanna start with this example. Uh, this is a sea star that was collected uh, out of the Vineyard Sound um, uh, several summers ago. It was in the side of a quay hog shell. And on one side, you see this, um, this arm is actually regenerating right there, so all the other arms look normal, right? What was interesting is that on the other side of the, uh, of the dead quay hog was this, was the other arm regenerating the complete animal. Now, this is nature. There's no genetics or any manipulation of anything. This is just nature. Somebody got hungry, and somehow the, the arm got lost, but it got, got, didn't get eaten, and then you get, you get a result like this. When two fragments of an animal give rise to complete animals, I like to refer to this type of regeneration as bidirectional. It works in both ways, okay? There's another type of regeneration that's a little bit more common uh, in, the, uh, in, in the natural world, and um, this is, I refer to it as unidirectional. I'll show you why in just a second. But this is a close relative of ours. This is a hemichordate. Uh, the species on the, Pacific, on the Atlantic coast is, uh, tyco, uh, sorry, Sacoglossus, it's Chilocieri, and this one is from the Pacific. Uh, it, it's called Tacovera flava. And the reason why I have selected this one to, to study it further is because it does something that it's not supposed to do. Um, we've been told that almost all of the animals that lead to the uh, lineage of the chordates, this is a hemichordate, okay, very closely related to us, uh, they, can they can restore perhaps after amputation appendages, but never the head. Well, this particular uh, hemichordate did not get that memo because you can decapitate it, and in about 15 days, it'll actually regenerate the head again as an adult. This is not an embryo. This is an adult. So now imagine turning on as an adult from pre-existing tissue all the necessary gene regulatory networks and cell behaviors that are required 
to give rise to a head from scratch without the benefit of having all these embryonic axial patterns that you need to establish in order to set up anterior from posterior. Big mystery, but they do it. And so the question is how and, and why? Because the body is capable of regenerating the head, but the head is incapable of regenerating the body, I refer to this type of regeneration as unidirectional. And then there's another type of regeneration which all of us right here as we sit down digesting our lunch uh, are doing, which is re I refer to as physiological regeneration, but this is the best example. These are the ungulates, deer and moose. Uh, the male of the species will actually shed their antlers every, every spring. And every season when this happens, the antlers will be grown again. And what is remarkable is that it's not a random growth. It actually remembers the topology of the antlers from the previous season. So every point that you see um, right attached to here, that this was the first season. It grew it again on the second season. That's the second season. So you can actually tell how old the deer are by counting the points. If you put all these antlers right next to each other, it's a time lapse. So this suggests to us that this is under strict genetic and cellular control. So this is not a random event. And it's a, an event that involves epithelialization, vascularization, neurulation, uh, ossification, etc. It grows very quickly, and then everything dies, and you're left with the bony structures, which are the antlers, right? Now, no injuries are introduced into the system. The antlers are just shed. And because it is a normal physiological process that does not require an external insult, I refer to this as physiological regeneration. Now, I've chosen these three organisms just to show you that it's not just crazy animals that can do regeneration. These are all very close relatives. Nobody can argue with any of us that that deer is not a mammal, okay? It is a mammal. And it does remarkable regenerative things. And so the question is, why is it that not all mammals can do this? Why is it that regeneration is so broadly but unevenly distributed across the animal kingdom? And so you would argue perhaps that this is a very rare event, but if you now look at all the known phyla uh, giving rise to the, uh, to the animal kingdom, everything that's in green has species that are either capable of doing one, both, or all of these types of regeneration. The ones that are in black, we don't know. Not enough animals have been amputated to determine whether or not they can regenerate or not. So about 20 some years ago, <clears throat> in trying to identify a system that might allow us to make some you know, mechanistic inroads in understanding how regeneration is executed in, in animals, um, I decided that uh, it was going to be platyhelminthes. And I will tell you the story some other time, but it's a really interesting story, but it's a process of elimination. And the reason why I chose these animals and this platyhelminthes, particularly this animal right here, the Planarian Schmittia mediterranea, is because it actually possessed a number of attributes that will allow me perhaps to extrapolate whatever I find in this animal to other systems where we really want to understand why regeneration may or may not be happening. What you're seeing there is that little white tube that looks like a straw. That's the pharynx. This is how they eat, and they're eating a liquid diet at the moment. And so um, they're trying really frantically to uh, imbibe uh, this thing. It's not alcohol, but that's what it looks like, right? Anyways, so why do we choose these guys? Well, they're bilaterally symmetric. Um, they have derivatives of all three germ layers. That means endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, just like, like you and I. And they also... Uh, co co possess a collection of very complex organ systems. That means a central nervous system, an excretory system, a digestive system, et cetera, et cetera. And more importantly, in nature, they actually exist as both a sexually reproducing animals, obligatorily, and sexually reproducing animals, right? And what is interesting about these animals is that they have essentially utilized a sexual reproduction as a way to manifest the process of regeneration. So, <clears throat> Let me show you where these animals were collected. Uh, they were collected in an abandoned fountain in 1998. This is exactly the day that they were collected. You can see that it was not a pristine place. This is not what I would call idyllic uh, field work. And uh, at the time, this park, the Park of Montjuic in Barcelona, Spain, uh, was a drug addicts park. So it was not safe. We were told, skedaddle from here once the sun sets, because uh, you're, you're going to be in danger. But we're able to collect the animals here, and you would not imagine, and I could not imagine at the time, that from ponds come, because it's literally what this is, you could actually build not just a career, but the career of multiple people that had come through the, um, through the laboratory. Just give you an example. All of these labs are the result of us going to collect ponds come in Barcelona, Spain, right? And so, um, and so this is what I, uh, what I, what I, what I think is, is important to keep in mind is that you never know where the great discoveries are going to come from. They may be from established model systems or established organisms, or it may be from something that just caught your eye. 
And then you began to dig and dig and dig until you found a way to find an experimental vulnerability in that system for you to begin to ask questions and get answers in return, right? So I, I am actually uh, I'm, uh, amazed when I put this slide together uh, that uh, from such beginnings, I mean, we would be where we are today. I would have not been able to anticipate that, uh, even in my wildest dreams, okay? All right, so I told you these animals reproduce asexually. So I'm gonna show you how they do it, all right? So you have a single animal here, a video with two cameras. One is videoing the animal from the side, which is at the very top right here. And the other one's videoing the same animal from the top. So here are the eyes, that's where the head is, right? So I'm gonna start the movie so you can see what happens. The head is gonna to begin to crawl towards three o'clock on the screen. The tail is gonna be anchored in the substrate. And now what's gonna happen is that it makes these really weird undulations at the very top, and then the tissue just snaps just like an old rubber band, right? What you end up with is an animal that looks like this. One that has a tail that doesn't have a body, which it needs to regenerate, and then a body that doesn't have a tail, which it needs to regenerate. And that will happen, and then from one animal you get two. That's a sexual reproduction, two to the N, almost like replicating DNA, right? And so what you have now is a situation where these animals are using what we would call regeneration, bidirectional regeneration, to sexually or asexually reproduce, to perpetuate themselves as a species. So when we, when I actually learned about the ability of planners to do this, I thought, well, you know, here's a system where the problem of regeneration is truly exaggerated. And if the wild type phenotype is this striking, imagine what this is going to look like if we can perturb it. And so the goal now was, how can we perturb the system? So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of what we've been doing with these animals. So we learned recently that one of the reasons why fission or this asexual reproduction can actually take place is because it's invoking the functions of two signaling pathways, the TGF beta pathway and the wind beta catenin pathway to allow for the behavior to manifest itself. So the signals themselves don't have, little, have little to do with the fission, but they have a lot to do with the behavior that the animal needs to anchor the tail and move its head away so it can actually snap at a predetermined space. And so, uh, and the reason for that apparently is because as the animals get larger, there's a number of mechanosensory neurons at the very top of the animal that uh, when they're together, they're repressing the ability of the, these animals to represent or to manifest this behavior. But in, as, this, as the animals grow and the neurons begin to separate from each other, the behavior manifests itself, all right? Not a very com uh, a satisfactory explanation. Much more details need to be done to try to understand how these things are integrated with each other. But nonetheless, that's what's going on. And here's a, a teaching moment uh, for, that was for us. What I'm gonna show you here, I was very excited about and also very embarrassed by this, okay? And so these animals, we were cultured in such a way that they could get really big. And we're having difficulties mounting them on the cover slips and the, on, on the slides to be able to put them under the microscope. So what you're gonna see are the uh, unmanicured fingers of Chris Arnold, the postdoctoral scientist doing this work, putting pressure with a cover slip on top of this animal. Here's again, a slower motion, uh, so you can see it. When you exert pressure on these animals, these compression planes reveal themselves. They look like segments, right? Now, the reason why I say this is very exciting is because I've been told for forever that planarians are unsegmented animals. And I've been told that, you know, because they don't have segments, they're probably very old and ancestral. I'm not so sure that they're unsegmented anymore. And I'm embarrassed because this should have been discovered hundreds of years ago. Because I will tell you, cover slips have been around for at least 200 years, and so have on manicure fingers, right? So why this was not discovered before is still a puzzle to me, but that also suggests to me that there's probably a lot more that we have been so arrogant to think that we know so much that we have not discovered yet. We're blinded by our own, you know, what we think advanced understanding of biology. And then these things reveal themselves, and then you're just scratching your head, wondering what the heck is going on. All right, so we thought perhaps that, um, that the reason for this, uh, uh, um, uh, the appearance of these uh, segments might have something to do with their ability to reproduce asexually, right? And so I wanted to know if these compression planes arose in the animal in some specific or some random way. And it turns out they actually follow a very pre-specified and well-defined and stereotypic uh, uh, process. So you can see an animal that's very small right here. It's about uh, three millimeters in length. And as the animals get bigger, the first compression plane appears. They get bigger, another one that appears at the very front of the animal, gets bigger, a third one appears at the very anterior end of the animal, and so forth and so on. And that's the correlation coefficient on your right. The order and the locations are specific. It smells like a segment, but it's, it's really a segment, right? 
So then I asked Chris, hey, Chris, what happens if you cut these animals and then look at a fragment? Will the fragment regenerate these this, this, uh, compression planes as well? So we did experiments. So we took the animal, we amputated, we took the trunk, let the trunk regenerate, repeat the experiment, let him grow, and we essentially see the same results. So this is a stereotypic deposition of these compression planes along the anterior posterior axis of these animals. It was very surprising, right? And so we thought that maybe uh, this is the reason why these animals can actually undergo fission. So we tested the wind and beta catenin pathway, the ones that prevented fission from happening, and asked, did the compression planes be altered by this? And they were not altered. They were completely indifferent to the wind and the beta catenin and the TGF beta pathway. So we were really scratching our heads, wondering what's going on. So here's what we have now is that, um, you know, we now have this cryptic and perhaps invisible until compression of these uh, uh, segments in the animal. And one day, uh, as I, we normally do, going down to the cafeteria to drink some coffee, you know, Chris and I began to ponder, we know what's going on here. And I said, well, you know, maybe we're thinking about this in one way. I know these are adult animals, but maybe segmentation in these animals may be similar to what the segmentation occurs in other systems. And many of you will know the segmentation from flies to humans takes advantage of the trophy genes of the genome of every metazoan, which is the Hox genes, right? So you have this expression of Hox genes from the anterior to the posterior that delineate these particular sets of, uh, of, of segments. But we've known for many years, uh, ever since you assembled the first draft of the planarian genome, that planarians actually have all 13 members of the Hox genes. But we have no phenotypes. People have been trying since the late 1990s to get phenotypes out of these uh, uh, Hox genes, but we couldn't get a darn thing out of them, okay? And, but now I say, well, you know, these are different times. Uh, we are now in a condition where we can actually reveal these compression planes. The animals are bigger now. So what happens if we were to take all of these Hox genes, clone them, and subject them to uh, RNAi to see whether or not they have an effect on the ability of these segments to appear? And lo and behold, what we find is that posterior 2B, for example, uh, this Hox gene in the middle, now the planarian looks like it should look when you squash it, just like a squash broken egg, right? It's just really horrible, right? But if we now silence the genes for Hox 3A and 3B and both of them together, we see now the appearance of supernumerary compression planes, suggesting then that these so-called embryonic genes are actually playing a really important role in an adult biological context. Again, it violates preconceptions. It violates ideas. I think the reason we have not discovered this before is because most of the experiments that are done with planarians are done with animals that are about three millimeters in length. They don't have these compression planes. And again, that's an example of how arrogant we can be because we think that if we can culture these animals in the lab and we can put them under the right conditions for us to do the experiments, we don't need to know anything about their natural history. When the reality is that when you go into the field and you collect these animals, they're very long. They are very long, but when you bring them to the lab, the domestication process forces them to become very small. And by doing that, a lot of biology disappears. And because it's invisible, we don't see it. And then we're arrogant enough to say, well, if we don't see it, it's not there. Until you go to the field and you look at these things and you realize, oh, crap, all this biology is there. We have completely ignored, right? So it's a call for you guys to think about the natural history of whatever system you work with. Because they've been subjected to massive domestication and a lot of things have happened to them. All right. So... Um, Another reason for selecting this animal is because all of this plasticity that I've shown you so far is actually driven by a collection of pluripotent stem cells known as neoblasts, which are depicted here in this yellow dot that you see in, in, in the animal right here. Each and every one of these dots is a single stem cell. It's a neoblast. As you can see, they're very abundant. So abundant, they, they were originally described by Harriet Randolph uh, in 1893 uh, when she was a master's student at Bryn College at a time where T.H. Morgan was the chairman of that department, which is how I think that Morgan learned about planarians. They learned from, from, from Harriet Randall. And the two papers that Harriet wrote in 1893 and one in 1898, they are seminal papers for the literature. They re she really covered the entire uh, uh, spectrum of uh, planarian literature. And nobody knows what happened to Harriet Randall, uh, except for those two papers, okay? And so um, these animals um, contain these stem cells. These are the only cells that divide in the uh, asexually reproducing animal. That's a way to look at mitotic activity in the cells. And then these cells, as they divide, they produce a number of different cell types that allow for the formation and the uh, maintenance of all of the tissue types and organs that make a planarian a planarian, right? And this is the work of many laboratories, in, in my, my own in, included, and many people who are really trying to understand the population dynamics of this adult pluripotent stem cell. So many years ago, um, uh, An Zhang, when he was a postdoctoral student or a scientist in, in, in the lab, 
um, he wanted to find out if there was, in fact, a stem cell, a true pluripotent stem cell. So we purify these cells by the content of uh, one gene that uh, manifests itself only in very undifferentiated cells known as peewee. And you can see here it's about 8,000 cells. All of them have very high levels of expression of this gene called peewee. And then um, we subjected them to single cell sequencing. This is a procedure that allows to describe the expression profile of individual cells simultaneously, right? I was expecting something simpler because we spent three years purifying these highly, highly undifferentiated cells. And then we get this result and it gives us like 12 different clusters. So the really high peewee were very different. I was expecting maybe one or two, but not 12, right? And so we look at the expression profiles of each of these clusters, and they all seem to be progenitors, perhaps, of some uh, differentiated cell types, okay, from epidermis to muscle, et cetera. And then when you look at the content of P, we just to confirm, is essentially the first seven clusters are very, very rich in P. -wee. They're almost indistinguishable from each other, and yet all of them appear to represent different cell types. They have different transcriptional uh, uh, um, uh, profiles. So that was very mysterious. Now, we found one cluster we refer to as NB2 that we have not seen before. So we wanted to characterize that a little bit better. Uh, we learned that it expresses a uh, transmembrane protein on its cell called tetraspanning. We developed an antibody against that and attempted to purify those cells from that population. So here is that cell. I was very excited by this uh, picture when I first saw it maybe five, six years ago because I realized now uh, as well that this is probably the first time that a known adult pluripotent stem cell has ever been filmed. And you can see how all these little processes coming out, which I thought at the time they were artifacts. They're not. They're real. I mean, we've now been able to see them in vivo. And so uh, the idea is as follows. I told you these are the only cells that divide, right? And so what we can do is that we can take planarians and subject them to ionizing radiation. And then when we do that, all the dividing cells die. So now you have an animal that doesn't have any dividing cells, only has post-mitotic cells, and they'll survive for three to four weeks on the virtue of those cells not dying yet, right? So the question is, if we take this purified cell and we put it back into an animal that has no stem cells, will it rescue, right? And so here's the single cell that was injected into one such animal. And then what we found essentially is that with some frequency, approximately a quarter of all injections that we did allow the animals to recover, restore the viability and the regenerative capacities. So one cell was enough and to, to allow this to happen in pre-existing post-mitotic tissue. So that suggests that there are pluripotent stem cells in these animals, right? The problem with this experiment is that um, it's not clear um, to, uh, to me how this can be. Because a quarter, the number is too high, and uh, the number of cells that are present in all of those clusters, you know, uh, I, I cannot imagine that they're not uh, pluripotent as well. And so we've been trying to fit all of this data into a deterministic model of stem cell biology, where you have a stem cell that renews itself, produces progeny, and goes on. And it's localized in a very specific place called a niche, right? That doesn't really play well with the data that we have uh, in planarians. And so we've been toying with the following idea, that uh, instead of thinking of stem cells as a deterministic process, we're thinking of it as a probabilistic process, where the stem cells that are captured at, at, at any given time the expression that uh, the cell expression that they manifest at that time is not static, but it's actually dynamic. That these cells are changing subtly their expression profiles through time. So if you were able to follow one cell through time, for example, this cell one right here, that's expressing this particular cohort of genes represented in red, give it some time, maybe they'll express a slightly different genes, we'll call it orange and green and blue and so forth and so on. So what you capture in time is not really a constant, it's actually a variation on a theme, right? And so, uh, and I think this is probably happening also for um, uh, post-mitotic cells. So there are corollaries to this model. It's something we're trying to, um, to, to prove wrong uh, in, in, the, in the following years. But the corollaries are as follows. That for stem cells, this frequent transient expression of fate markers results in large numbers of transcriptional states. So that's why we saw 12 clusters in these peewee high positive cells, as opposed to just one. I also would say that for the differentiated cells, they're probably there, but they're infrequent. They're less numerous the transcriptional states that you cannot really uh, uh, distinguish quite well. But the virtue of regeneration is that when you introduce a perturbation to homeostasis, if the tissues are to respond, they have to change what they're doing in order to replace the missing structure. So I would say that wounding will alter the frequency of such transient expression states and increase the transcriptional state numbers for both the, st the stem cells and the differentiated cells. So Blair um, um, Benham-Pyle, when she joined the lab, 
uh, decided that that's what she wanted to do. And the reason why we decided to do this is because we've been reconstructing the planarian by a serial scanning electron microscopy to see how these cells are interacting with each other inside of the animal. So what I'm going to show you here is uh, two cells. There's a neoblast, a stem cell that's undergoing asymmetric cell division, shaken up like a maraca. The mitochondria come out, so you can count how many mitochondria are in each, and the crystalline structure is the membrane of the cells. And you can now remove that and see the chromosomes in telophase, right? And what is interesting about this cell division is that we've seen a lot of these asymmetric cell divisions appearing in close proximity to this muscle fiber, which is the pink structure in the middle, right? So is that a correlation or is that a, a, a cause-effect relationship? We don't know. As we reconstruct this further, and I'm going to show you the same two cells, okay, surrounded by other cells, which is this. That's, that's the cell right in the middle, that crystalline structure right there. That's the cell you just saw divide. And now that's the muscle is in, in purple. But there's these two very large parenchymal cells. And you can see all these processes that are in direct contact with the muscle, with the stem cells, the daughter cells, et cetera, et cetera. These are cells that we don't know what they do, all right? I mean, but they are surrounding the, the cells. So whenever you see a cell dividing in a diagram in a textbook, it's not vacuum. It's surrounded by all kinds. I don't even know how they find the strength and the pliability to actually do this in this very tight uh, space, right? Okay, so how do we tackle this problem? Well, the strategy was as follows. This is a Blair's work, as I was mentioning earlier. We would actually select three biological contexts. The intact animals, uh, sublethally related animals, where we wipe out most of the neoblasts, but leave some behind. And another where we wipe out all the neoblasts by lethal irradiation. We would identify the smallest fragment in the planarian that can regenerate a complete animal. Okay? That turned out to be a biopsy of about 0.5 millimeters in diameter. And then we would allow these biopsies to regenerate through time, such that by day 14, you will have complete little animals. Then we would select a sample from each of these time points and uh, process them for um, a single cell uh, production ending up with about 21 samples, right? Three treatments, uh, seven time points. And they would subject all of these cells to single cell sequencing, right? And that's what this looks like. So you have 21 samples. Those are the UMAP distribution of those individual cells. In total, it's about 300,000 cells. And what you can do with this is now begin to ask questions about how do the cell types change as the animals undergo regeneration? The first thing we want to make sure is that we, did we leave any cell types behind? Did we capture all the cell types that are present in the animal? And we did, and that's what these colors represent. The various colors represent tissue types. Green is muscle. Uh, the stem cells are right here in the middle, okay? Uh, the purple right there. And then all the different cell types are there. So that's great. Uh, so they are there. We, we, we capture everything we needed to capture. Can we distinguish differences among cell populations between uh, these various experiments? And the most obvious one, of course, are the stem cells, because I, I mentioned to you that under sublethal irradiation, you know, most of them disappear, and that's what you see right here in comparison to the one on the left. And the lethal irradiated, a very small fraction of cells is left behind, okay? Suggesting that the experiment really did work. But we're not so interested in the different cell types, but actually the transcriptional states of these cells. So instead of decorating these individual cells with their identity, according to tissue, we can decorate them with the time at which the cells were collected. And so that's what this uh, next slide shows, is the different um, colors represent when in time the tissues were collected. And what you can see here from every tissue type is that we have a really nice representation from time zero to time 14 for every single uh, type in these animals. So we can do some interesting things with these results. So here's muscle, right? Now we can ask, how does muscle behave from time zero to time 14 after regeneration? And can we identify differentially expressed genes? Now, this is muscle. All muscle is supposed to be muscle and behave the same way. But we were surprised, for example, that only a subset of muscle fibers we're turning on this particular gene nodum, which are these little green dots that you see uh, right here, okay, uh, for a very short period of time. They're early on, and so you don't see them per perdure for the 14 days. That was very surprising to us, okay? Um, we did the same thing for all the, the other two uh, uh, germ layer derivatives. We did it for the skin, for the ectoderm, we did it for the gut, for the endoderm, and we found subsets of cells that were expressing subsets of genes for a short period of time uh, and in, in, in a specific expression profile. So what we find, for example, is that the genes that were expressed or activated in muscle, like this collagen and notum, they're expressed really early on, and then they decay rapidly until they're no longer detectable, say, past day five, okay? Same thing is true for genes in the ectoderm, like Rutledin, Hadrian, the ones in the middle right there. They rise very quickly in expression. Not all the cells express it, but then they decay rapidly such that by day 10, you no longer detect them. 
And then other genes that we're expressing the gut cells that are expressed really almost in a biphasic fashion. They reach a zenith at around day five or day, day six of regeneration, and then they drop until they're no longer detectable by day 14. Now, this is all correlation, you might say, but if we now select these individual genes that are expressed for very short periods of time in a small subset of cells, they have dramatic effects when you perturb their function. So all the genes that were expressed in muscle affected the polarity of regeneration. The animal didn't know now where to build the head or where to build the tail. Uh, genes that were expressed in, this, in the ectoderm, uh, all of these genes were regulating stem cell proliferation. So we would see hyper or hypoproliferation. And then the genes that were expressed in the gut actually were necessary to maintain the population of stem cells and to allow the tissue to remodel itself. Remember, this is a, a little biopsy from the tail. It's never made a head. It's never made the tube with, it, with, with it eat, so it needs to remold everything. And so because these things are real, we decided to give them a name, which is that we refer to this as tracks or transient regeneration activating cell states, meaning then that there may be actually situations under which so-called terminally differentiated tissue can actually change its expression profile to do specific things. And it's not all of them, it's just a subset of them. And we're able to see them because of the scale of the experiment. If we had done fewer cells, I think we would have missed all of this biology again. Okay, so where do these cells reside? Well, the cells, uh, ultimately, we don't know, but we've been trying to do uh, something we refer to as spatial transcriptomics, which allows us to measure the expression profiles of these cells in situ, right, where the cells reside in the animal. So the experiment is simple. This is our, our pandemic project. Uh, we amputated the animals, allowed two time points, six hours and 48 hours post-amputation. We embed them into this matrix known as OCT, and then what we do is that we section this such that we can get these really thin fillets of prosciutto, planarian prosciutto, okay, <laughs> express it here. And then we use one section here for um, H&E, so we can see the tissue tabs that are present in there, DAPI to count all of the cells in the sections. And then we put one of these sections on top of these little pucks. They have all of these beads that have these little oligo oligomers or uh, uh, um, oligonucleotides sitting in there with very specific barcodes where the reverse transcriptions will take place to make a local cDNA library that is going to represent whatever that cell was expressing at the time, okay? And so it tells you the location, and it hopefully will tell you the identity of the cell by its sequencing characteristics. So now we're looking at where these beads are. So we ask, do we have all the seven major tissue types that are found in planarians represented in the beads? And we do. We can take now all of these beads, use the same uh, uh, statistics that we use for single cell, and ask, can you give me clusters? And it gives us a lot of clusters. But because these beads are larger than the cells, some of the beads are confused. They'll give you expression profiles of one cell type and also expression profile of another cell type on the same bead. People told us this was going to be a bad thing, but I thought it was a great thing because it's going to give me at least a sense of proximity. If I see two expression profiles in one bead, it's very likely those two cell types are close to each other. So we tested that. And we focus on the two uh, clusters that are the bottom behind the, uh, the, uh, the simulcast, uh, 26 and 17. And uh, what we find is this, is that, in fact, uh, the, 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 the correlations we saw in the beads are actually playing out uh, in vivo. So in purple is one of these long parenchymal cells I showed you earlier. We know very little about them. You can see on the left, the green represents the uh, cells expressing P with a stem cell marker. White are the nuclei, that's the DNA. And so now what you can see is that at six hours post amputation, there's not really a close association between these two cell types, but by 48 hours, the cells are pretty much on top of each other. And when we perturb the genes that are manifested in this process, we actually perturb this association, suggesting that this is a situation where the neoblasts themselves are not really occupying a permanent niche. They're really moving around a lot. And I think the niche in planarians is the friends you make along the way, which suggests, again, that this plasticity of expression may actually have something to do with uh, why is it that we don't understand regeneration so well. So I'm just going to conclude this part by sharing with you the following. So we think that these stem cells interact with a diverse collection of differentiated cells, and these interactions are all responsive to injury, which is really fantastic. I don't know how it works, but it must be some global effect that every single cell can actually detect in some fashion. The disruption of just one of these stem cell microenvironments is enough to perturb regeneration, which was not anticipated, right? And so that's actually very interesting in of itself. And I think that this uh, regenerative capacity in planarians may really depend on this diversity and plasticity of both the stem cells and the tissue types, suggesting that maybe, just maybe, this um, probabilistic model that I shared with you earlier might have something to do uh, with this uh, capacity of these animals to regenerate. And it's something that we don't really know to what extent it may or may not be happening in all of us as we uh, sit and listen to what I'm saying. Okay, that's great. 
Um, and, but uh, what about very press, right? Because um, at the end of the day, a worm is a worm. And, uh, you know, we don't look anything like them. We share a lot of genetic uh, information with them, a lot of the families that they have, gene families that we have, et cetera, et cetera. But clearly, we're different, right? So I've been trying to test this notion of plasticity uh, to see whether or not it does or does not play a role in the process of regeneration in, uh, in animals. And so this is the fish part, okay? And so right now, when people look at uh, regeneration in vertebrates, they look at a vertebrate that can regenerate try to extract the genetic information that is associated with that behavior, and then in the hopes of taking that and transpose it to an animal that does not regenerate, like a mouse, for example. You cut the tail of a mouse, you cut the tail of a mouse. Okay, that's it. Uh, but you cut the tail of a zebrafish, which is on the left, and it, re it will regenerate. And that's uh, what Dr. Nebrit showed uh, already in 1929, right? But the problem with this approach is that these two animals are separated by at least 435 million years of evolution, okay? The fish were here before the mammals were here, okay? And so um, I surmised the following idea, which was, well, do fish that share common ancestry evolve at or about the same time, um, do they regenerate in the same way, right? And so the question was essentially, can I take a related fish, in this case, uh, this killifish right here, Norobranchus furzeri, and ask, does it regenerate? And when it does regenerate, does it regenerate in the same way that zebrafish does? If I were to present this to the study section, they would laugh me out of the room. So, of course, they're going to regenerate the same. They're all fish, you know, so no. Uh, triage, submit some other time. Uh, so, but, you know, they, they, we're lucky enough that we didn't have to, to do that. Why killifish? And why this particular African killifish? Because, you know, when their ancestor was roaming the earth, okay, the sub Indian continent shown up here, okay, this was part of. This, the eastern part of Mozambique, that's part of Pangaea. And then as the continental um, uh, um, uh, plate began to, to move and brought India subcontinent all the way to the roots of the Himalayas, it brought killifish, uh, it left killifish behind and it brought zebrafish up there. Now in the Himalayas, which is above the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, there's always water. They live in constantly flowing water, everything is fine and dandy and it's a great system to do all kinds of things. But the fish in Africa, they live more time out of water than they live inside of water. Why? Because they have, there's seasons. There's rainy season and there's dry season. And dry season can sometimes last years, okay? So how do a fish survive in such an environment? Okay, so because they, they live uh, like, like this. So when it rains on the savannas of Mozambique, you get these ephemeral ponds. They only last the summer and then they evaporate. And so when it rains, the minute you go out, there's fish swimming all over the place. They didn't come from the rain. They are the embryos that were dormant for years before that were awakened by the freshly uh, uh, dropped rain, right? And so the life cycle is very similar to, uh, to, the, the, to the fish cycle with some really salient uh, 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 differences. So there's the zygotes, I mean, that's the fertilized uh, um, uh, oocyte. And then those embryos can actually stop and wait for months to continue, uh, uh, to continue embryogenesis. There's another time when diapause can take place, which is when the uh, body axis is formed. That's what these little lines right here are. That's the posterior end of the, of the fish. The head will be on the other side. And um, they couldn't rest there. But this is my favorite diapause. Diapause three, the embryo is essentially almost done. That thing that you see there in the middle, that's right. That's the eye. It's looking at you, okay? And, uh, and that thing can sit like that for years. I have embryos in diapause three that I collected from a colony that, um, was first uh, developed by uh, Ambrunet in Stanford. I've had them in desiccated for five years now. You can put them back in water and they'll actually awaken again and they'll finish their life cycle into a larvae and then eventually they'll become um, uh, an adult. So now the question is, under these really different selected pressures, if regeneration is subjected to, uh, to evolution, which it should, there should be some differences in how these animals uh, regenerate. So the question is, how much divergence does occur in the regeneration response? You know, the comparison will help us identify the species-specific responses. I am convinced that some of the things that are happening in zebrafish are very important to zebrafish and zebrafish alone. And same thing for the killifish, right? But I also want to know, what is the common denominator? Because this stands to have been present in their ancestor, which is really the basis of all of this evolutionary work that we're trying to do to understand this process, right? So we look at their tails, 
just like Dr. Nebri would have done. We amputate the tail of, 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 of zebrafish, we amputate the tail of killerfish, much more colorful, much more beautiful, I think. But they also regenerate for 20 days. Uh, in 20 days, they're done. Which is the first surprise because this fish right here, zebrafish, they get to live for like two to three years. These guys get to live for 30 to 40 days. They're very short-lived as adults. So it's a great system for studying aging, right? But in my case, since I'm not getting any younger and I want to study adult regeneration, I want a fish that becomes mature very quickly. And so this is one of them, right? So now what do we do? We compare their expression profiles. We look 24 hours after amputation, uh, isolate cells, extract RNA. And this was the first surprise that came out of this study is that killerfish turns on about 2,900 genes and it turns off about 3,400 uh, genes. But zebrafish, uh, in contrast to, uh, uh, to, um, to killerfish, is an exaggerator of expression because killerfish is expressing just a fraction of that. About a third of the genes expressed during regeneration in killerfish uh, are, are present in there. And if you compare the two sets to each other, the numbers get even smaller. Only 500 up and down regulated genes are shared between the two species. So the other genes, they're important to the fish, but they're not really perhaps important to this process. We look at the genome to see what parts of the genome are being activated, and we find the same thing. Many more peaks of activation are found in zebrafish. It's about um, uh, 4,200, and then in killerfish, about 1,900. And then if you cross-reference these regions of the genome that are known as enhancers that are supposed to drive gene expression with the genes that we detected next to each other, 204, we reduce the number from 500 to essentially about 49 shared genes between killerfish and zebrafish that appear to be involved in regeneration. Everything else did not pass muster, okay? So now we can ask the following question. We pick one of those uh, regions of the genome that got activated by injury, and then we use that to generate uh, these reported constructs that allow us to see whether or not that can actually turn on a gene into a little uh, uh, um, uh, transgenic uh, vector. And then uh, this is the work of Wei Wang. He identified a fragment this, uh, from, this, uh, um, from this promoter, uh, KS4, that is capable of driving the, the expression of GFP only in the regeneration of blastema, 24 to 48 hours after amputation. It did not respond to injury, it only responded to regeneration, suggesting that there may be plasticity in the genome that allows certain regions of the, of, of, of the, of the genome to become enhancers that respond to injury, but not only to injury, but exclusively to regeneration problem. So we tested whether or not these fish can regenerate their hearts, they can. You can see the amputation was done right here at the apex of the heart. And then essentially by 18 days post-injury, the apex of the heart was regenerated. Same transgenic uh, fish that we cut the tails, we cut their hearts, and we see expression again of this reporter gene in the newly regenerating heart. Suggesting that the enhancer is not just specific to the tail, it seems to be specific to regeneration. So I think this is probably the first regeneration-specific enhancer uh, that's been described. And so the proof, of course, is in the pudding. So we can use CRISPR-Cas9 and delete that region of the genome and ask, can the fish regenerate? The problem with these experiments usually is that almost every gene that's been described to be involved in regeneration is also involved in embryogenesis. So the embryos never make it to adulthood for you to know if they're involved in regeneration. So let's test this. I mean, and so we deleted this region of, in the genome and we actually got heads and homozygotes. They survived to adulthood, but they could not regenerate. So whatever this gene is being turned on during embryogenesis, whatever region, is not really involved in regeneration. And so this one, for example, prevented regeneration of the heart and really seriously delayed regeneration of the tail, suggesting that perhaps these enhancers are really regeneration-specific enhancers. So what's in this enhancer? Well, um, it's uh, what my postdoc at thought was very boring. It's uh, um, uh, AP1 complex. I, I was very excited. The AP1 complex is in yeast to humans. So if you want to invent new things, that's probably what you want to do. And this complex is varies in composition. But if we delete these domains, you can see that the expression is gone uh, in the transgenic animals for both zebrafish and, and killerfish. All right. So here's the hypothesis that I would like to posit, and then I'll conclude, uh, which is that what may have happened is that the ancestor could not distinguish between wound and regeneration. Any type of perturbation to uh, homeostasis we actually trigger our response. And then as um, these uh, enhancers were repurposed, as uh, evolution uh, exerted some pressure on these systems, the combined function of these enhancers began to be split, such that now part of the enhancer only responds to regeneration and part of the enhancer only responds to, to injury. And it turns out that at least for the fish that's been separated in killifish and in humans, we found the same enhancer. It responds to injury, 
but it does not respond to regeneration. And we have now brought the human enhancer into the killifish, and it only responds to injury. It's not responding to regeneration. We suggest that there really is a redistribution of functions here. So I think that's very interesting. So here are my considerations and conclusion to everything I told you so far. I think it's really important for us to not forget of the following, which I think adult cells possess remarkable plasticity. They're not just what they are. They are actually entering and exiting various states depending on what the physiology or what the demands or age or whatever of these cells are. I would like to convince you that we need to move away from the term terminal differentiation. To me, terminal differentiation is death. That's it. A dead cell is terminally differentiated. And instead, we should think of these terminally differentiated states as stable differentiation states. And those stable differentiation states are and can be subjected to changes depending on, on, the, um, on, on, on the environment in which they find themselves. And I believe, and this is a belief that needs to be tested experimentally and, and scientifically, that to reveal the mechanisms that promote and suppress stable differentiation states is going to be essential for us to understand why is it that some animals can regenerate and others cannot. It might be that they cannot occupy these, trans, uh, these transcriptional states as easily as other systems are. So understanding what really is pushing the, the brake and, and, and pushing the gas is what's really going to allow us to perhaps solve this mystery of regeneration in, in the years to come. The last slide is for uh, the most important slide. These are all of the people that uh, um, did the work that I showed you earlier uh, for, for this presentation. Uh, the work on the isolation of the stem cells was done by Anne Zhang, shown right here. The killerfish done was, work was done by uh, Wei Wang. I don't have a single picture of him with his eyes open. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, the work on fission was done by Chris Arnold right here and Blair. Uh, and Blair did the work also on the track cells that I just shared with you. And then uh, Stephanie is uh, in, in charge of doing the 3D reconstructions uh, along with uh, Mo right here. And all of these people are my colleagues at the Institute who helped me with the uh, uh, spatial transcriptomics. And with that, I'll stop. And I may have gone over time, so I don't know if there's time for questions. Thank you. Of course. Um, Thank you. If, if people are thinking about their question, I'll ask you one. I'm, I'm just really curious about uh, the organ that's the pharynx, the, the mm -hmm. pharyngeal mm -hmm. structure. Have you, has that been isolated? And does that regenerate the whole? Yeah. So that's one example of unidirectional, yeah. right? So um, Carrie Adler, when she was a postdoc in the lab, that's what she worked on. So she found a way to eject the pharynges, almost like a, the, uh, the co pilot seat of a 007 car by just adding uh, sodium azide to the water for a short period of time, the pharynges are ejected. And then we can see that those pharynges will not regenerate complete animal. The animal will regenerate the pharynx. And we surmise that the reason for that is that the pharynx is devoid of stem cells. It has none of this neoplasm. In it. And so we think that may be the key reason why it cannot regenerate a complete animal. Yeah. Other. Alejandro, that was wonderful. Thank you, Susan. Um, I, I wonder, since when you think of regeneration, you need cell growth and cell yeah. division. And a major control point in the cell cycle uh, is initiation of DNA replication. So I wonder if the enhancer for regeneration mm -hmm. is stimulating the initiation of DNA replication. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the uh, the um, the, uh, the initiation of um, of uh, cell division is what's actually maybe priming the DNA to become an enhancer because we only detect these changes uh, of um, of. Uh, um, of acetylation on that region of the uh, of the chromosome after the cells have begun to divide. And so that's about 24 hours later. So there's something that's happening to that genome, okay, during, during the process of amputation that now de-represses, so to speak, that region such that it's exposed for AP1 and whatever else is binding to it to drive the expression. But I do think that the entry into the cell cycle will dramatically change some of the epigenetic marks and perhaps even the 3D distribution of, this, of, 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 of the genome in the nucleus that allows it to now do something with it, right? Uh, we still don't know what the origin of the cells are for regeneration in this fish. Some of them come from bone, others may be fibroblasts, but we don't know yet. So it might be interesting to see whether or not they both get to the same place by making the same changes, but we need to first delineate, you know, what the source of these cells might be and look at them from time zero to time uh, to 24 hours after amputation. And we can do that now. Uh, and I wonder if I could just ask a short follow-up question. That is, many cell types, when they're subjected to stress, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that true for regeneration? Um, in planarians, no. Uh, in the fish, we haven't seen it. Um, there is some example of polyploidy in heart regeneration in salamanders and axolotls, um, but uh, it's not a, a it's not a given. Um, and as you know, some cells in, in in cardiac tissue can be binucleated, and so that might be part of it. Uh, the liver is notorious for 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 polyploidization, but uh, as far as I know. On appendages, this has not been seen. Uh, thank you. No, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the um, the enhancer um, the, for for regeneration versus injury is fascinating. You said that you only, you see the signature only for injury, say in human cells. Now, what about if you looked at you know deer? Yeah. Um, who are able to regenerate their animals? <clears throat> yeah, we we haven't looked. Um, there are genomes coming online now. In fact, there's a beautiful paper published in Science, I think, uh, three months ago where people actually did single cell sequencing of antler regeneration, they found a cell population that supposedly drives this. And so I'm really keen to see how many tools are going to become available. But we look broadly uh, to um, other systems, uh, uh, particularly mammals, to see whether or not these enhancers look like. So what we found, for example, is um, the spiny mouse, also from Africa. Um, this mouse, um, actually can do something really remarkable. It's not, it doesn't have antlers. This is not, it's not an antler mouse. But um, they're nocturnal animals, and um, when the birds of prey descend upon them at night to grab them from the scruff of their necks so they can get eaten, the skin falls off. And the mouse come down to the ground, they run and they bury completely naked, I mean, on that surface, okay, down to the muscle, and they'll regenerate all of that. Okay? And so there's a group in Kentucky, uh, Ashley, Ashley Seifert, that's studying this work. This, this, this. And so we have some resources there. We look at that genome. We found the enhancer. Now what we're doing essentially is uh, I, we're playing structure function with enhancers. We're taking the human enhancer, the uh, commis enhancer, uh, enhancers from uh, salamanders, uh, more ancestral fish like garfish, and just play. Make, you know, chimeras, and they just play. And then put them back into the killifish as a uh, transgenic animal, and then see what we can what we can do and the goal would be to ultimately collect whatever is binding to those pieces of dna and subject that to transcriptomics and then see what is what what's in there right that, that's in there so it, it will come i think but, yeah. Gary has a question. okay and then there's a question back there thank you sorry you first oh thank you so thank you. it's a little out of track question probably like if you uh, think about the natural selection of Darwin's theory and then go to the use and disuse of the R organs uh, as per the Lamarckism theory. So this, uh, I mean, regeneration of these organs, or if you take an example of uh, house lizard, the wall lizard, they have like a tail is cut and somehow, and then they regenerate the tail. Mm -hmm. So why this regeneration process is, is in the small animals, but with the like higher level, they uh, they lose this property to to evolve to regenerate the organs. Can you yeah. tell well, us? Well, that's a that's a great question. Um, okay. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you, I do not know the answer to it, <laughs> but I will tell you that large animals can actually regenerate um, uh, organs. Um, uh, for example, uh, it is known that um, some uh, cetacean species, um, things like dolphins and some smaller whales, they can actually regenerate tissue quite well. Um, and so whether or not it's used or, or disused, that's also the jury's out on that. Um, Morgan in 1901 did a very clever experiment with uh, very tiny little arthropods. They're like little, um, little shrimps. And uh, these little shrimps that have these um, appendages in their mouth, which are absolutely necessary for them to ingest food. So literally just move like this, okay? Those are the only appendages in the animal that cannot regenerate. Every appendage beneath regenerates. So that's the one you would think, yeah, that you want to regenerate because it's the one that's most in contact with the environment, right? But it doesn't. So it has to wait until the next molting period, if there's a molting period, for these organs to appear again, right? And so, um, so it's not clear. Uh, there's no correlation right now. People have argued it's maybe it's the genome size. That doesn't apply either. People have argued, well, maybe it is the scale, but there are fossils of uh, very, very large dinosaurs that have evidence of tail regeneration. And uh, then you find things, well, maybe it's not only, it, maybe it's aquatic systems or, or there's nothing like that. But, you know, we have a lot, they have a few fossil records from crinoids, for example, where you can actually see them regenerate their siphon. I mean, so 
it, it's just such a salt and pepper distribution that it really has defined, you know, simple explanations with regards to drift, positive selection, or negative selection. And it may very well be that all three happen. And this is the big mystery for me for regeneration, which is that in 2023, it's embarrassing, okay, we don't know if regeneration emerged once in evolution and then, you know, evolve in different ways, or if it has emerged multiple different times independently. And I don't care which one is right. Okay, maybe both of them took place, but we don't even know that. So when you start comparing the transcriptional profiles of hydro regeneration, salamanders, planarians, and so forth, there's still not enough information for us to say, aha, these are the common denominators, so therefore it must have been ancestral. So that work still needs to be done. And that might shed some light on, you know, what are the factors that allow certain species to retain uh, their regenerative capacity versus others that do not. But even with that information, I think we won't know yet. Because there's also plenty of examples of close related species that live in the same ecosystem, compete for the same resources. You cut one, it dies. You cut the other one, it regenerates. And so what gives? And there are other systems in which it disappears from the lineage and then reappears again in a, in a separate lineage. So it's a puzzle. Yeah, granted, it's a puzzle. I mean, it's a really interesting puzzle, but uh, we don't have really a solid answer right now. It's not a copout. It's just... <laughs> it's what it is right now. So. Last question. Congratulations on the amazing discoveries and wonderful story. Thank you, Gary. Tomorrow, the keynote speaker will focus on the most important cells in the oh, body, which yes. is <laughs> the germ, the germ cells and yes. their virtues. <laughs> Yet, not once did I see that word on your slides. And so I'm wondering <laughs> are your animals obligate asexual, or did you just miss it? No, um, they actually are obligate asexuals, um, but um, you have to remember these asex the reason for picking these animals, which I didn't explain, is that they actually arose as the result of a Robertsonian translocation. They have four chromosomes, from chromosome one to chromosome three. That completely abrogated their hermaphroditic reproductive system, okay? So they reach an, a stage in their development that is comparable to the juvenile of the sexually hermaphroditic reproductive strain, right? And then they're stuck there. And to reproduce, they do fishing. Now, the sexually reproducing animals, they have bona fide germ cells. And we do find expression in a small subset of neurons. This is work of Phil Numeric of things like nanos, for example, that we label. And the cells appear to be located where the future, you know, unlagging of the reproductive organs might be. But they stay there, they don't go any further. And so I think that's getting resolved now because the genomes of both sexual and asexual have been uh, fully mapped. And so people are now beginning to look to see what is it that got disrupted there to, uh, uh, to produce this. The other thing I will tell you, finally, for this is that unlike most other systems, and Cassandra will definitely will talk in much, with much more uh, uh, authority on this matter, but um, our animals, uh, when they're born, they are completely devoid of reproductive organs. So the germline arises in the adult, including the germ cells and all the attendant, you know, somatic tissues that make the reproductive system work. So they look just like asexuals, right? So it is, it is what it is, <laughs> okay, Gary, I mean, but, but that's how these animals uh, address this issue. Yeah. No, oh, thank you. Actually, okay. there's time for one more question, it turns out. Yeah, there was a hand back there. Yeah, there. Yeah, sorry, this is gonna be two questions. I'm so sorry. That, that was a great talk. So the first thank question you. was, were there any sex-specific differences when you're looking at tail fin regeneration? Yeah. And the second question was, um, when you were looking at this enhancer, were you thinking about going into like chromatin confirmation capture methods mm -hmm. like HiC to see, you know, which gene or genes yep. that enhancer is modulated? <clears throat> yeah. So those so, are so great questions, and we looked at both. Um, at, for the uh, capacity to regenerate both tails and and hearts, we have we didn't test any other systems in both males and females, indistinguishable from each other. The reason for preferring the male is because the tail of the male is pigmented, so we can always cut in pretty much the same place. The female tail is unpigmented, so to cut precisely, we'd have to actually cut the, uh, count the number of, um, of uh, um, segments in the actinotrichia, the bone, and if you're gonna do hundreds of these, that's probably not what you wanna do. And so it was for practical reasons. But uh, we tested this on both, because we were also wondering whether or not there's any type of, um, of a, you know, sexual uh, modification of, of these processes. Um, I mean, mammals, you don't have to go very far, right? I mean, so when you think about estrus and, and the growth of mammary glands and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cycles of menstruation, that's constant regeneration, which males don't do, right? 
And so uh, there are going to be differences. In this particular case, at this level, we saw no differences, right? Um, with regards to getting a better handle on what's happening at the genome level, yes. So Wei now has started his own lab. He's going to do all the six that you can imagine, you know, attack, seek, run, seek, 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 all that stuff, okay, in the hopes of trying to identify, you know, the, you know, what is the minimum number of cis regulatory elements, trans is going to be harder, but cis regulatory elements that may be involved, maybe not responsible, but involved in the process and begin to dissect it that way. Because, I mean, you know, there were, there were 1,700 peaks, but we only found 49. And out of those 49, we have now tested seven such enhancers. They all behave in the same way. So I know we're missing stuff, but I, I don't know why we're missing it. Right? So that's, that's what Wei is going to do. So I'm, 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 I'm counting on him to shed some light on this. But great question. Thank you. Okay. Well, this was really great. Thank you so much for this. And if I can just um, say that we're going to take a few minutes to rearrange some furniture here at the front of the room for our panel. So let's reconvene at 320. I also want to say that we do have another room where the simulcast will run. So there are seats for people who are currently sitting on the side. But if you would rather go to the uh, simulcast room, Mark Johnson can show you where that is. Mark is here, and he'll come over here and wait for people who might like to go to the simulcast room. So thanks again, Alejandro. Thank that you. was wonderful. Could everyone find a seat, please, so we can start our panel discussion? All right. Um, I'm delighted to be introducing the, our panelists and moderator for a discussion uh, dealing with preparing for roles in academic leadership. Uh, and I am going to introduce our moderator, Dr. Logan Jin, and then he is going to uh, introduce the panelists. So um, Dr. Jin is the Assistant Director for STEM in the Sheridan Center for Teaching and Learning here at Brown. Uh, he got his BA in, sorry, pardon me, BS in biology and BA in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He then earned a PhD in biology from Arizona State University, where he was an NSF graduate research fellow. And his dissertation centered around the experiences of STEM students with disabilities. He's also served as the program manager for an NSF S STEM program focused on involving community college transfer students in undergraduate research. And now here at the Sheridan Center, Logan works on initiatives related to teaching and professional development for STEM graduate students and postdocs. He's published extensively on teaching and learning, both here at Brown and before, and we're really delighted to have him moderating this conversation today. So let's welcome all of our panelists and Dr. Jim. Thank you. And uh, so hello and, and welcome everyone uh, to our first panel of the conference. Um, it's really exciting to see everyone here. Uh, our first panel uh, is entitled Preparing for Roles in Academic Leadership. And I have the uh, honor to be uh, here today to moderate the panel and the pleasure to be joined by our three distinguished guests, uh, Dr. Stacey Lawrence, Dr. Chloe Poston, and Dr. Kamani Toussaint. Um, so what uh, we'll do to begin in the panel is have our panelists introduce themselves um, a little bit about their current role and positions that they're in in academic leadership and some about their journey to their current position. Um, so with that, we will have Chloe get us started. All right. So I sat in the hot seat unexpectedly. So <laughs> here we are. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back on campus. My name is Dr. Chloe Poston. I am Vice President for Culture, Belonging, and Strategic Engagement at Dartmouth College. 
um, a little bit about how I got here. So my background is in chemistry. Um, so I am a proud graduate of Clark Atlanta University. Um, I did my graduate work here at Brown uh, in bioanalytical chemistry with an emphasis on mass spec-based proteomics. And I left Brown and did a postdoc at Eli Lilly and Company, uh, industrial postdoc, and really looked around and felt like, hmm, there aren't a lot of people who look like me in senior leadership around here. What's that about? And so in science, as many of you might know, if you ask enough questions about why the research workforce looks the way it does, you end up in policy in a government conversation. And so I did a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship with the National Science Foundation, looking specifically at the research workforce for two years, and then transitioned to do consulting work where I looked at similar problems and got a call from a mentor who said, come back to Brown. We need you. Um, so I worked here for about four years. The first two years, I was working for the Leadership Alliance, which is headquartered here at Dartmouth. Uh, sorry, at Brown, <laughs> um, which is headquartered here at Brown. Um, I was the uh, associate director of the Leadership Alliance, which connects uh, individuals from historically underrepresented populations to spaces like Brown or other Ivy League or Research One spaces so that they have a chance to build social capital and be successful in graduate school. Um, I transitioned from that space because I felt like I was... Uh, trying to help students become prepared to be in a space that wasn't prepared for them. So I wanted to switch to actually make the space better for the students that I was putting in those places. And so I switched to start working on organizational diversity and inclusion and thinking about what that looks like in a meaningful way. And I uh, was here at Brown doing that for two years and recently transitioned to Dartmouth doing some other work. And so I, I'm happy to speak about any of any piece of that journey, but really excited to just be here today and see all of you here. That was awesome. <laughs> all right, so good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Stacy Lawrence. I am the Senior Associate Director for STEM over at the Sheridan Center for Teaching and Learning. So if you're here at Brown, it's in the Sciences Library. I'm located on the seventh floor. Logan is my direct report, but he has free reign to ask me whatever questions he wants to ask. You won't get in trouble. Uh, and so I started off, uh, I have a bachelor's uh, in biology, molecular biology, biochemistry uh, from Clark University, which is in Worcester, Massachusetts. It's often confused with Clark Atlanta. Um, and I then went on to do a bridge program, uh, a master's to PhD bridge program that was a collaboration between Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, and Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I also did my research at two of those institutions, and in addition to that, Meharry Medical College. So I spent three years. Oh, some who, what? Yes, yes, so fun. Uh, so I had a great time exploring all of Nashville those three years. Um, I had a transition during my graduate career. So while I trans, while I started my PhD work at um, Vanderbilt, my lab moved uh, to Yale, and so I ended up working at Yale on my uh, PhD in plant molecular biology. So. Hey, Mark, you're not the only one. Uh, at that time, I did work on plant immune systems, um, which was a pretty cool project. Um, I then went on, I guess while I was in graduate school at Yale, I was also a diversity fellow. So in the office that's very similar to OIED, uh, there were diversity graduate students who worked to kind of improve the circumstances for peers uh, on campus. Um, I think Brown has some version of that as well within the graduate school. Uh, after that, I directly transitioned into the Center for Teaching and Learning at Yale, and I did a six-month internship or job there, and I really enjoyed that work. So that work was primarily working with grad students and postdocs on their teaching development. Um, but we had this program that was new at the time called CERTL, and now we actually brought CERTL to Brown, so I'm really excited about what that will look like for the community here in terms of grad students and postdocs and their teaching development. Um, here at Brown, I've been here for about seven years, surprisingly. Um, and I work with faculty, grad students, and postdocs all in their teaching development. Many of the folks in this room I've seen in some capacity uh, over that time. Um, my work is not just ex in, per like, in particular in the classroom, so it extends um, into like 
what faculty members might do in order to increase diversity, equity, inclusion on campus as well and improve what STEM education looks like for all students who want to learn about STEM. And I'll stop there. All right, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kimani Toussaint. I am a professor in the School of Engineering uh, here at Brown, also a Senior Associate Dean for Research and Strategic Initiatives. Um, career path, so I'll give you a super condensed version. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania uh, originally, and uh, went to uh, school in inner city Philadelphia, Overbrook High School, um, uh, famous, infamous, depending on who you talk to. <laughs> Uh, my undergraduate was at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Um, there I studied a bit of a few things, physics, chemistry, math, ended up with an uh, African American studies degree actually. And then I went on to uh, Boston University. Uh, originally I thought I was just going to do a master's in photonics, uh, has to do with manipulation of light. Um, I wound up deciding to stay a little longer, did a PhD. Uh, in electrical engineering, specializing in, in uh, something called quantum optics. So still with light, but at the level of individual photons. Um, and during my last year of my PhD, so I never thought I would do a PhD, one, uh, because I thought, you know, you have to be in school forever. And that wasn't me. And then th my mindset changed along the way. Then I said I would never do a faculty position, you know, because you're going to be in school forever. And the yeah, unrelatable. And during my last year, I did an actually a very cool program at Georgia Tech, uh, sort of a bridge to faculty program called the FOCUS program. Um, and I decided to give this thing a shot. And so I went to University of Chicago, uh, worked with a, uh, for a postdoc position, worked uh, with, uh, in chemistry actually, uh, with a physical chemist, with doing things in ultra fast optics, a little spectroscopy, nanoscience, um, and uh, afterwards, I uh, went to University of Illinois at the Brandon Champaign. It's two hours south of uh, Chicago. And if anyone's ever been to Champaign, okay. <laughs> I say you would appreciate the <laughs> context. All right, so <laughs> it's literally in the middle of cornfields. Uh, but you get a lot of work done, right? So <laughs> that's the uh, trade off. Uh, so I was there for 12 years. Um, in the Department of Mechanical Science and Engineering, uh, and I had uh, affiliations in other areas. And in fall of 2019, uh, my family and I moved to Brown, uh, where I am now in the School of Engineering. Uh, my, my path to, um, uh, so I guess, fallen in administration was certainly not planned, and as you can see now, there's a bit of a trend with this, so I just forget about planning anything. Um, it's one of those things that happened during the pandemic, and so I can talk more about that later. Um, my lab works uh, in areas that have to do with harness and light for microscopy, imaging, as well as developing novel uh, physiological sensors that can be applied equitably like the pulse oximeter work that um, some of you may already be familiar with in terms of the challenges with pulse oximetry. And that's me. Great, and thank you for that. And so you each touched on this um, some in your open remarks, um, but to open up the conversation, um, I'd like to ask how did uh, each of you come to realize that a career in academic leadership was uh, right for you? Or was there a particular event or a series of events that have led to you wanting to pursue your current role? And uh, the way we can do this is feel free to um, take the question popcorn style. Um, and not everyone has to answer every question. <laughs> but someone has to answer one of the questions. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, based on what you were saying, if you sure. could just elaborate on what you were. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so I actually try to avert, uh, avoid actually going into academic leadership for the longest time. Uh, because uh, even now, I, I still view myself as a researcher first. Um, and I just never understood how anyone in administration can also do research and also be good at administration, 
right? Because it's, it's really a full-time task, right? Um, but uh, circumstances, right place, maybe, right time. And, um, you know, I was asked to consider the position. Um, Brown is a relatively small institution relative to my previous institution. And uh, I thought that um, it could be an interesting way of uh, making an impact. And so I said, let me give it a try. Maybe I'll try for a year. X number of years in, yeah, I'm still in the position. Uh, and I will tell you, it's, it, it is a jungle uh, being able to um, follow, uh, be super responsible with doing the administrative work. And at the same time, you know, I have seven students, two postdocs. So maintaining the lab, you know, working on manuscripts, writing proposals, you know, and having a family, you know, so all of these things, there's only been so many hours in the day. So this was one of those things I did not plan for, uh, again, but it was one of those things that I, I realized that I'm, I'm not bad at it. Um, but if you do it, as with anything else, you know, you have to kind of go in eyes wide open and really just figure out a way to juggle you know, these different aspects of what you consider to be important to your life. Um, I think I can add to that a little bit. Um, for me, I was coming out of working in industry and then working in government and working with some of the people who were um, true decision makers within the NSF for the NIH. And I really felt like in order for me to be fulfilled in terms of the work that I was doing, I needed to be in a space where I would be able to impact an entire institution, not just a department, not just a classroom. And so that is really what drove my decision to pivot to thinking about what does administration look like? What skill sets do I need in order to do that successfully? Um, and... Um, you know, different from my colleague here, like I am not trying to run a lab at the same time, right? So that's a whole other beast of responsibility. So hats off to you. Um, but I really am motivated by the idea that you can create organizational change in these types of roles. Um, so for me, that felt really important in the same way that when I was working um, in a more programmatic space, it felt great to know that I would get thank you cards from students who said, thank you for that conversation. As a result, I'm now at XYZ institution earning my PhD, whatever it might be, right? So like, I think what's important is to know what will motivate you personally and think about those things as opposed to thinking about um, the title, positionality, et cetera. Like it, Every, no matter what your role is in higher education, there's just going to be a lot of work. Like, that's just what it looks like. And so thinking more so about what your internal values and motivators are feels like a, a better way to pursue what your interests may be. I think I'll add to that and say, I think prior to this panel, I had to ask myself, am I in academic leadership, right? And I think the answer is yes, right? Because we all have to learn how to lead from where we are, right? In doing the work that I do with folks in the classroom, we all have power. Faculty are not the only ones, just because they're teaching class that have power. Students have power. Learners have power as well. And so I think if you continue to do the work that you want to do um, and lead authentically or be, show, be authentic as you can, I think that people will see certain things in you, right? They'll nominate you for certain things. They'll call you in for certain things. And that gives you an opportunity to do things differently. And that looks like like leadership in a lot of situations. Great. And so um, thank you all for that. And you each touched on this um, a bit, but what are, in your opinion, what are some of the most rewarding aspects of, of your roles? I can go first. Okay. All right. So for me, I love learning. I love going into classrooms. Um, I love part of my job is to provide uh, feedback and consult with faculty members and grad students on their their teaching. Right. And so I'm a lifelong learner. I love coming to sessions like this and learning about your work. I participated. I listened to the the zebrafish regeneration uh, conversation. And I think expanding that to a much broader audience is really important, right? So it's not just the students who are at Brown, but thinking about how we can teach beyond the classroom that we're in here and giving faculty members the power to communicate better, right? So I think part of the reason why I came into this work is I wanted to do social justice for science, right? And you can interpret that however you want to interpret that. Um, but I think I'm able to do that from where I sit and from where I stand simply because of what I'm motivated 
motivated to do. Um, and every day looks different, right? No two days are the same, but I think leading with that um, allows me to have a lot of positive days. Uh, there's not a, there's no lack of work to do, uh, but I think it, it helps to reframe some of the work and those challenges, knowing that um, that's what's motivating me. I would say for me, um, the the things that motivate me are the outcomes, right? So, I, of course, I have a project manager mind. So I enjoy being able to make sense of things and making a, a wonderful spreadsheet and being able to have a perfect, you know, Gantt chart. But none of that um, are the things that actually motivate me. What motivates me is when a student walks in my office and says, I'm about to graduate. Thank you so much for the space that you created for me here. Um, thank you so much for letting me be heard. Thank you for making sure that there's space for me to be seen and letting me be authentic, at least in this space, um, as I'm on this journey to become whomever. You know, those are the things that are most important to me, and those are the things that keep me motivated. I would say the best days are not the days where there's a big PR splash about something I did. The best days for me are when I get a surprise thank you note. Um, those are the things that really keep me going. Nothing to, nothing to add. Uh, and so, um, so relatedly, I, I would also like to ask, what are some of the, uh, the challenges that you face in your roles kind of in, um, in this academic leadership space? Um, I, I guess probably just about everything's a challenge, uh, in a sense that, um, you know, a lot of, so there's, there's an irony, right? So there's a perception of academia from the outside and then there's being in academia, right? And one of the things I learned, uh, even when I became a professor, was that you have to learn how to become a professor, right? Uh, and, you know, people who teach in schools, go to teaching school, right? And they learn how to teach. Pedagogy is a whole area. So to a certain extent, uh, at least in my experience thus far, um, being in that academic administration is also a learning process. And part of that is knowing how to interact with your colleagues in a way that might be a little different from how you interact with them um, uh, as a colleague, right? And knowing how to interact with students in a different capacity. So. That process I've learned along the way. I'm sure I've made tons of mistakes um, in, in that learning process, but you know, I like to think that there's a lot of things I did pick up that I'm doing um, uh, better now. So the interactions and then the subtle point of, um, so I tend to be very introspective about things. And when you're in administration, at some point, I think more often than not, you ask the question, well, what's the goal? Right, and if you look at this as some you know higher level concentric circle, uh, then you realize you know all right, what's the goal of what I'm trying to do? What's the goal of the school? What's the goal of the university? And then you start to understand the different dynamics, uh, stresses and strains that each school, depending on whether it's public, private, land grant, has. I was completely oblivious to all of that prior to starting this position. And so it informs a lot of what I do and how I approach problems, understand the goals of the university as I move forward. So that in itself, again, no handbook. You know, you learn from interactions, you learn from talking to colleagues across, the discipl uh, across disciplines especially. Um, and hopefully you get, you know, more great things that come out of that, you know, the outcomes, so to speak. I think one of the challenges is uh, c coming into these roles is thinking about knowing the game and knowing the systems and structures you're working within. So um, I would say trying to get anything done in the higher ed space is really putting together a puzzle. So you're thinking about what are the things that each of the players at hand need. You're also thinking about what are what are the outcomes going to look like for the students? Because the students, in most cases, are completely oblivious to a lot of the conversations that are going on. So how is this going to play out for the students? And then also thinking about what are we actually trying to achieve? What are we trying to solve for? And coming up with real solutions for that within the confines of shared governance and whatever hierarchy is in place. 
like thinking about creative solutions that actually meet all of those requirements and also move all of your constituents towards some more positive outcome, right? Like, so you're constantly thinking about all of those things. For me, that is exciting and interesting. It's an interesting challenge. Um, I think the way to get well-versed in that as a graduate student or a postdoc is just to think of, to jo- join a committee, just join a committee and see what it looks like, like get a sense of, okay, we're on this committee. Are we making decisions or are we making recommendations? And if we're only making recommendations, who who's making the decision? Like ask those questions, who's making the decision? Like get a sense of what the these institutional structures look like so that when you're in a leadership position, then you have a sense of, okay, I've been asked to co-chair an advisory committee. Advisory means you're not making any decisions. Like, you need to know that, right? So, like, thinking about all of those pieces and knowing where you do your best work and knowing where you feel like you're going to add value feels like the best way to sort of manage those challenges. For me, it's an interesting problem, so I enjoy it. Um, I encourage you to look for interesting problems in higher ed. I'd say change is slow. That's the biggest challenge that I have. Um, And so um, one faculty member, one instructor, one person might be doing something really great over here. And the rate to see that move across the room is extremely slow. And sometimes I feel like it's this huge task and we all can't. It won't, it won't be solved in my lifetime, right? And so I think um, the challenge is learning how to be patient. Um, uh, Mark is smiling at me. <laughs> uh, uh, learning how to be patient when things, because we are moving, we're working with large groups of people, right? If it were up to me, I'd make a decision and it would be done. However, we have to work with hundreds and thousands of people to see change. And sometimes... Um, yeah, we won't be here to see it it manifest, but all we can do is keep on keeping on. Um, and closer, you spoke uh, to some of this in your um, in your last um, answer, but um, what advice might you give to someone um, in terms of getting a chance to either explore um, or a chance to um, experience uh, academic leadership in an early career phase like graduate school? Yeah, so I can elaborate a bit. Um, so when I was a graduate student at Brown, now I just feel old because I said that. Um, <laughs> but I availed myself to every council committee activity I could possibly sign up for. I was the president of the Nebraska Black Graduate Student Association. I was on the um, Diversity and Inclusion Oversight Board. Like, I was really trying to get an understanding of how this place works. And as a student, you don't actually get insight into that until you start to join some of these administrative committees, right? So whatever your interest may be, even if it's a departmental committee, like all of those things are spaces where you get to see, okay, what what does a faculty meeting or interaction look like? What does, um, what are the decision-making um, criteria for a variety of things at the institution. Like these are ways that you can sort of start to gain insight into what higher ed looks like. The other thing I'd recommend is being extremely active in your uh, professional society. This is another space where you can build connections with people who may be doing work that you're interested in, who, again, might invite you to participate or provide insight into other activities. Um, But really having a really broad perspective beyond just the work that you're doing day in and day out, like as a graduate student or a postdoc, super easy to just go into the lab every day, do your experiments, do your analysis, write up whatever it is and go home. So if you know that you have broader aspirations, I encourage you to make space and time to to think about um, bigger problems, like take a moment to look around your department and think about things that you might want to change and have those conversations with your PI and also your chair. And those are people who could point you into the direction of, oh, you seem to have a lot of ideas. Let me add you to XYZ group who's thinking about those things, right? So those are ways that you can kind of get your 
um, name on the list or be on be on people's radar for these opportunities. But just really taking time to sort of take a step out of the lab and look around and see what's going on and think about ways that you may add value, um, I would say are the, the primary ways uh, that you can start to get your foot in the door as it relates to academic leadership. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, now in the, in the spirit of uh, Dr. Nabret and, um, and thinking about the mentor that he was and the mentorship uh, roles that he played for early career scholars, uh, what role or roles did mentors play in both your professional and personal trajectories to your current roles? Everything, I guess. Um, I think we are nothing without the people who came before us, right? And so, I mean, you could be something. I don't know, maybe. In my experience, I have been, I could not be where I am today without the people who came before me. Um, I, I have someone who's still emailing me stuff about things that are irrelevant to where I am right now, but they're just like, you'd be great for this role. And I'm like, thanks for seeing that in me, but no. And so I think part of it is that, you know, you have to think about ways to cultivate um, so a support network right um, cultivate mentors cultivate friends cultivate colleagues that'll help um, share things with you when things come across uh, their plates and so I think um, I mean much to what Chloe was saying just before right it's not all about what happens in the lab but taking a step out of the lab to get to know people um, administrators other faculty members in your department that you might not be working very closely with um, to cultivate a, a community of people who are supportive of you and the things that you want to do and begin to articulate those things that you want to do. The more people you talk to, the more you get practice, um, what is it, like like structuring your message and what you want to say. And then the next time you turn to somebody, you'll have a more refined version of what it is that you want to do so that when you come across somebody, they'll be able to help you in the ways that you want them to help you. And so I think I've been <laughs> very good at just meeting people and people wanting to share simply because I've, I've, I've said something that uh, resonated with them. Um, so I think that was the answer to the question. Um, a similar thing. Um definitely a community of mentors so it's interesting like for me i had a bit of a rocky start in the whole college experience coming from my high school to a university and i didn't necessarily articulate my path forward in terms of um looking for a mentor but in retrospect that's exactly what i did was i looked for mentors and for my experience um I essentially was cutting and pasting mentors wherever, whenever, right? So there were peers who were only slightly older than me who were kind of mentors from some, for some aspect of my life, right? So part of, in my experience, um, seeking out mentors and the people who can help you get to those next steps is taking a little bit of time for you to figure out maybe kind of where you want to go in those next steps, right? So Because those people may not necessarily all be in class or in your school. They can be in your community. They can be in other universities. And so I took advantage of all of it. If there's anyone who had any interest in me at all, if they smiled at me at a conference, they automatically became a mentor. Seriously, <laughs> they didn't know that. Uh, and I was persistent, right? So I would, I would uh, uh, this is before social media, so, you know, email people. And I would email them, introduce myself, stay in touch uh, with them, follow up with them. And I learned something from each and every single person. There was one place I stayed at where the doorman was a mentor of sorts. And it's, it's fascinating what you can learn from people from all aspects of life if they have your best interest at heart. So you may not necessarily have, you know, a fellow electrical engineer studying optics to be your mentor, someone who was a civil engineer who saw, took an interest in me, gave me an opportunity to get exposed to some aspect of academia that I didn't even know existed. And that was like an initial turning point. And so being able to put someone who was in uh, academic administration, who didn't have a PhD, who told me about the program uh, at Georgia Tech, who became a mentor. 
right? So it was definitely a community. And I think um, when one thinks about a mentorship network and community, that, um, for one, perhaps relaxes uh, some level of uh, stress on the mentor themselves, right? Because it's very hard for one person to be a mentor to everyone. And secondly, you actually get a little bit more of a textured experience, I think, if you're open to seeing potential mentors everywhere and anywhere. So that that's basically, and I'm still always, so be careful about smiling. So I'm always still <laughs> looking for, for mentors. Sorry. I don't have much to add. I agree. Mentors are everything. I haven't, uh, in real life, y'all, I haven't applied for a job in the last two years because my mentors have been like, here's a job for you. <laughs> Um, so no, mentors are everything. Um, thinking about identifying people who can give you different perspectives, right? So having individuals who are your peers who can give you feedback, having people who have lived exactly what you're going through, having people who have a completely different perspective and can say, I know that you're on this path, but have you considered this other thing that could also be in the wings for you? Um, so this idea of having like a, a group of mentors um, is is one that really resonates for me that some people call it like having your own executive board or your own board of directors, these people who you can bring together or just send a text message to to say, I'm thinking about X, Y, and Z. What do you think about that? And knowing that they're going to give you honest feedback to say, mm, that's not for you. Or to say, actually, I think you might be a good fit, but you need to consider X, Y, and Z. So being really intentional about identifying mentors who um, both have shared lived experience, but also varied lived experience and also professional experience is a great opportunity for you to learn and grow from people who um, you otherwise may not interact with in a meaningful way. Could you uh, each speak a little bit more about how you uh, have built your mentorship network and kind of what that's looked like um, throughout your, your career um, in addition to smiling at people? <laughs> <laughs> I can start. I have no shame. I will send a cold email to anybody. I think it's super interesting and say, hey, I'd love to talk to you. Do you have 15 minutes for a cup of coffee? Most people will give you 15 minutes of their life, um, even if you have they're just kind of like, I have no idea who this person is. Um, the other thing that you can do is find connections. Right. So if you can find someone to do an introduction, people are way more likely to speak to you. Um, so lean into your networks, especially your alumni networks. I think they're incredibly underutilized, especially from people for people who um, may be underrepresented in their whatever their alumni space might be. Um, I think we don't take advantage of those networks. So uh, a good example is I said I did a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. That's an awful. And... That network is solid. Like, if I have never met anyone before and they tell me that I am a tri I, I'm a AAAS fellow, I'm going to help them, right? So the same is true for most alumni networks. So lean into those networks to say, if you can find somebody that is at a company where you want to work or is doing interesting work that you are doing, if you're in the same professional society, whatever connection you can find, write them and say, hi, friends, I'm X, Y, and Z person. I'm doing this work. I find your work to be incredibly interesting. I would love to just chat with you. Do not write to people and say, will you please be my mentor? <laughs> <laughs> it's too much stress and too much pressure, right? So just say, can, can you please chat with me for 15 minutes? If there's a connection, follow up. If there's not, cool, you're just out of 15 minutes and maybe a cup of coffee, right? So I would just recommend putting yourself out there, getting okay with the silence and maybe the rejection of it all, but then also recognizing that maybe 10% of the time you might meet some really interesting people and 3% of the time you might find a new mentor. And don't uh, limit what a mentor is, right? It doesn't have to be someone who's 5, 10, 15, 20 years older than you. It could be the person sitting to your right and to your left, right? Like some of my 
best friends are mentors to me. They're just one or two years removed from me in the process. They provide feedback on my writing. They provide feedback on my presentations. And that's a form of mentorship. It's a form of support. So we often think about mentors as being people who are uh, in different career stages, but they could be near peers as well. And I think, Kamani, you mentioned that. Um, so I, I think that's one a thing to do. And yeah, don't be shy. Like I've told grad students all the time, come into my office. I used to have candy for grad students. Students. They don't eat the candy. I eat the candy. Um, and so I stopped having candy. So, you know, I think part of it, and I'm looking at this group here because all of them have been in my office. Uh, but I think part of it is just being able to put, you know, just be open to putting yourself in front of someone else. People will give you the time. People want to help because people want you to be where you want to be, right? Like I think everybody here wants all of the students in the room and the postdocs in the room to be where they want to be and anything that we can do to help you make it to your goals, we'll try our best to do. But we will never know what those things are unless you reach out, right? I can't read your mind, um, but we I think we've kind of all made ourselves available, all the people in this room, and I think that you have to be the one to take that first step and reach out. I'll just add, if someone invites you to their office or says, stop by at some time or send me an email, send the email. <laughs> like, you need to send the email because they are trying to connect with you, but they're just asking you to make the first step. So make sure that you always follow up on those kinds of connections. They're not necessarily superficial, but for people who are incredibly busy, they want to know that you're actually going to be invested in the relationship. So that's why they're asking you to take the first step. I guess the one thing, so I, I agree with everything that's been said. The one thing I'll add is sort of um, what I learned is there's sort of a mechanics of uh, the network and mentoring aspect of things. For one, just like Chloe said, now that I think about it, when you mentioned it, I, I never asked anyone to be a mentor, right? Um, it's just the nature of the relationship, but right? you're getting something out of it. And presumably they might be getting something out of it as well. But, you know, when folks uh, used to be very much into just exchanging business cards, you know, at a, at a conference or a meeting and so forth, and you, know, you get a stack of business cards at your desk, it's like, what do you do with those business cards? Right? So I'm an optic, so I was sticking from the laser to be able to see the laser beam. But there are other things you can use them for, right? Like, such as the, the information on a card, right? And one of the things that I used to do uh, quite regularly were that the people that I thought I had some interesting connection with that I wanted to follow up with, I would send a very short email uh, reintroducing myself, given a sort of a one-sentence personal update and a one-sentence professional update. And I would do that like every six to eight months. And believe it or not, it's amazing how folks can keep track of that, right? No attachments, no images, just a few sentences, here's what's going on with me, I'm just graduating, or I'm moving to this other place, and it goes one. So I, I actually have now former students who do that to me, and you know they're like at the postdoc stage, and I knew them when they were an undergrad, and it's amazing how far that goes. So whatever process you might develop, being deliberate about that process so that you do follow up, taking advantage of the invitation to stop by an office, is super, super important. That, that's one of my first experiences as a graduate student. And I just knocked on the door. You know, there was no homework assignment, no exam. It was just literally, let me introduce myself, say hello, five, ten minutes. And before you know it, that was like a super useful, um, really mentor-mentee relationship uh, for me. So. No, that's really great advice. Um, thank you. Thank you all. One more question before we open it up for uh, questions from um, the audience here. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who um, is considering or would want to consider a role like your current position? say practice your relationship building skills. Um, so in academic leadership in particular, a, a lot of things hinge on your ability to find common ground with people. So figure out ways to connect with people that you normally wouldn't have a built-in affinity for. Introduce yourself to different people all the time. Introduce yourself to professors you normally don't interact with. 
introduce yourself to administrators you don't normally interact with because this is essentially what my job is all day. It is talking to people and trying to understand where they're coming from and getting a sense of ways that we can collectively work together to meet some goal, right? So if it were me, I would, if I had someone to tell me a long time ago, um, I was a graduate student who wanted to be in the lab. I was producing great work. I was publishing. That was enough. That is not enough. Um, you need to like go meet the professor who's doing something completely out of your wheelhouse. Um, go interact with people who are out of your field. Go interact with people outside of your department. All of those things will help you to then start to have a broader view, right? So academic leadership is all about big picture thinking, right? So your degree is very narrow, tailored to a specific problem. But if you want to be in a leadership position, you have to be able to do both. You have to be able to zero in on a specific problem and you have to be able to zoom out and think about, okay, what are the implications if I do this one thing that solves my narrow problem, but might have other issues in other spaces. So just create opportunities for yourself to think more broadly. Um, I, I guess the, the, the one advice, uh, sort of a little bit like what you said earlier, is um, things can move rather slow in um, academic administration. And so uh, developing a certain type of patience um, where you are pacing yourself. I mean, it's important, again, to be, you know, to help nudge things along for sure, right? So that at least something happens in your lifetime. But the um, expectation uh, of things, uh, impact of things that are beyond your control uh, requires a certain level of pacing. And again, I've been learning all of this on the fly, uh, but if you go in there with that mindset of you want to make change, you want to make an impact, but you will pace yourself. I think uh, you, you know, you wind up being careful about not burning yourself out because it's not that hard to burn yourself out in this position as well. I'd say, I say it was a grain of salt, not a grain of salt, but be cautious, but speak up, right? I think that there's space for authenticity um, in this space called academic leadership. I think that um, <laughs> we all have brilliant ideas and the ways that we communicate those, who we say them to matter. And um, speak up, don't keep your ideas to yourself because I think that in order for change to happen, someone has to introduce new ideas. And new ideas don't get introduced unless they're spoken, right? Or written down. And so I'd say speak Right. Communicate however you want, but be authentic in the ways that you might see things differently. Share that with people. So that's what I would share with someone. Okay. Well, this has been a phenomenal discussion so far, but now we would like to open it up uh, for questions from the group. Um, and I believe we will have a mobile microphone going around. Um, and if uh, before you ask your question, if you could just introduce yourself, say your name and where you're from. Hi, my name is Leticia Franklin. I am recently defended from Penn State University. And I have a question that, it's a two part question I'll say. Um, the first part is, um, so I've been told there's like a timeline in academia and that um, you have to hurry up and become a professor. Is it possible to do the opposite, right? So go into more of academic leadership and then build your research up later. And then I guess that would be a question more so for Dr. Kamani. And then my second question would be for um, Dr. Stacy and Dr. Klo. Have either of you considered kind of switching to do the work that you do now, but also maybe getting grants to do research? Right, yeah. First of all, congratulations. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's always a big deal. Um, so, I, so I think the idea of, let's say, doing anything else before you do, uh, let's say, an academic professorship um, has, you know, there's some probability greater than zero. 
but the operations don't always commute. And, and I say this in that, you know, academia as a whole, from, from my experience, from my perspective, is rather conservative. Their perceptions of what it means to be successful, that, to be honest, haven't truly been vetted, just appear to have been vetted. Um, so the probability is greater than zero that, yes, you can choose a different path and, and then wind up going to academia, but that's because you did some incredible lifting. It was because it was all because of you. Uh, what we're trained to do is we're trained to look for people like ourselves. Okay, you went through this hazing process of maybe doing a postdoc position forever, and then eventually you wind up starting out as a professor. And when you tend to deviate from that, um, there are exceptions. Uh, it can make people's heads spin, right? So schools that have deeper pockets, that because they have deeper pockets, sometimes view themselves as mavericks, at least in their own minds, uh, tend to allow for that a little bit better, okay? This person was a special type of hip-hop artist, you know, revolutionizing the spoken word. And because of that, this school decided to scoop them up and bring them into the classroom. Most schools don't do that. So understanding the nature of the institution, there's a Carnegie chart out there that talks about different categories of institutions is super important relative to the type of path you might want to take. So keep it in mind, you know, there's still the hustle of this is how academia works. So I wouldn't rule it out, but, you know, it's just a function of how much heavy lifting you might have to do in order to get to where you want to be, if that's the path you choose. And I think, so the question was whether we could write grants to do the work that we want to do. Yeah. Yeah, so the thing that I forgot to mention, which is the best part of my job, and Logan can co-sign this, is I do almost everything that a faculty member does except participate in tenure track related things. So people in my field get to do research. Logan has published a lot on this space called DBER, so Discipline-Based Education Research. People get entire faculty positions based on what he does. Um, I have opportunities to write. Um, I just went to an NSF writing uh, retreat two weeks ago where I learned how to write NSF grants. Um, you know, I coach faculty to do that anyways, but I got, you know, some more details on what NSF is actually looking like. There are all these resources out there to do pre-planning grants before putting in a full proposal for certain things. So um, I, 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 I truly said I love what I do. I get to do almost everything that I would have wanted to do being a faculty member, except the pressure to do research is more of an option for me. Um, and it's, it, it looks different because we work with people and behavior as opposed to plants and proteins. Yeah, I would echo that sentiment. So I still get to, for a, a good example, as I still sit on um, a council for the National Academies of Science, and Engineering, and Medicine, right? So I'm still publishing in that space. I'm still, um, anytime there's an institutional grant related to diversifying the STEM workforce, I'm generally a PI on it. Um, I am personally invested in staying in touch with what's going on with STEM at my institution, making sure that I'm creating spaces for those graduate students, undergraduate students who might need support. Um, so I still do all of those things. I still publish. I still write grants. I still um, interact with students. I just don't have a research program um, related specifically to STEM. That said, I still have an opportunity to publish on research that I would like to conduct in my space if I wanted to, right? So I think there are, there's a lot of opportunity there. It's not necessarily that you become a, a leader and now you have to just do away with all of your research and interests and ideas. It's not true. Um, I think a lot of it goes back to thinking um, or asking a lot of questions about what roles are looking like when you're applying for them and asking what leeway you'll have to uh, have some flexibility in pursuing some of your, your more passionate interests, in addition to, of course, completing whatever the job description is. Mm -hmm.
Hi, um, my name is Ash Uruchurtu. I'm currently a third year PhD student here at Brown. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for your insights. I feel like I've learned a huge amount. Um, I wanted to sort of ask a question to delve a little bit more into um, the recommendations you've made regarding looking for mentors and how to use your mentoring network. Um, essentially, like from your experience, what would you say are important red flags and green flags to look for when you're um, when you're looking for mentors, when you're building those relationships? I can start with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, look for someone who's going to challenge you. So look for someone who's going to ask you a whole lot of questions. Uh, your mentor shouldn't be telling you what to do. They should be making you think about what you want to do, right? So green flags for me are people who are asking challenging questions. There are people who are making me think about something I haven't quite thought about before. There are people who, when they speak, I want to write down everything that they say, right? Like... <laughs> Those are the people that, the, those are, are green flags for me. I think red flags um, look like uh, a lack of communication. They look like um, someone trying to create, trying to make you a carbon copy of them. Um, that's not what a mentor is supposed to do. They're trying to, they should be trying to make you be your best self, not a carbon copy of themselves. Um, and, oh, another green flag for me is a good mentor will introduce you to other potential mentors, right? So this person will happily leverage their network to introduce you to people who may be able to give you additional social capital in other spaces. So those are the kinds of things that I look for. I'll just say also on the mentee front, um, you have to be intentional about reaching out, right? Like people have tons of things coming through their inbox at any time. So be the person who, if you are in a mentor relationship, be the mentee who's always reaching out to say, here's what I have going on. Hey, can we still meet? Hey, what's going on? Hey, I've got this new paper. Hey, I'm working on a Like be the person you're in charge of managing that relationship, right? Because a mentor doesn't necessarily have much to gain from it. So like, be intentional about your interactions in that space because this person is giving you extra time they may or may not have, right? So I would also say your mentor may not reach out to you all the time, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. You should reach out to them, right? And maybe reach out to them two or three times. And on the third, third time you get to say, mm, this person isn't feeling it. Okay, that's fine. But like be persistent, I would say as well on the mentee side. I don't think I have much to add. I mean, you nailed it. That's perfect. Perfect. Hi, my name is Kennedy Franklin, and I recently just graduated high school, and I'll be, <laughs> I'll be uh, attending yeah, university congrats. this fall. And I was just wondering, what are some things that I could possibly do to better prepare me for if I were to end up going into graduate school after I graduate? Uh, college. I have a question. Where, so where are you? So you just finished high school. Where are you going next? Uh, we're going to the next Okay. Nice. Um, I guess I could say maybe doing research early. Right. So you can see, see everyone's nodding their heads. <laughs> right. So you can see what it's like, not so you can say that it's not for you, but you can just see what that process is like. Right. Research is very um, I don't think we do a very good job in society of telling people that it's mostly failure. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to be the one to say it. Uh, it's mostly failure, right? But I think the learning process, once something fails, how you iterate, how you practice thinking differently about the problem that you're faced with um, and how you figure out a new solution or a new pathway. And so it's, I, I struggle with the word resilience. I don't want to say that is, the, is what it is, but practicing that research skill is really important because that's what graduate school is all about. Um, and talking to people. So going to office hours, meeting your faculty members, knowing that they're real people too, and they're not just these big professors who are out there teaching you content, but they're people who have lives and families and interests as well, and getting to know them and breaking down those barriers. So I think those are two things that I would say that I tell almost all undergraduates to do when they come to Brown or anywhere that they go. And yeah. I 
underscore that this is doing research early gives you a chance to understand what you like and dislike. So great example. Uh, my freshman year, I uh, was a part of a research project where we were studying mice. I learned very quickly. I have no interest in working with live animals. That's why my PhD is in proteins. Right. So like you get a sense of what you're willing to tolerate, what works well for you, what um, types of work styles you have. All of those things come out pretty early as soon as you start trying different types of research, research projects. So also recognize that just because one project isn't for you doesn't mean research is not for you. It means you may want to try a different type of project. And I'll, I'll reiterate the, the exact same points. Um, research is probably what kept me in school at, in my undergraduate experience because uh, one of the um, fascinating things you learn about college is that not all of your learning is actually in class. And, you know, you'll, you'll get some materials for 50 minutes and then you'll come back to the class again a couple of days later and maybe again a couple of days later and you get exposed to the material perhaps even for the first time. And there's multiple exposures that lead to, you know, deeper learning. But the contextual part of why you might engage on a topic, you don't get until you're actually exposed in that research environment. Now, at the time, being 17, 18, 19, I didn't necessarily appreciate that, right? I thought it was just cool being in the lab. I didn't quite always translate all the deeper understanding that came along with that. However, later on, it's a cumulative effect. I had no idea the impact it was making on me over, over a long period of time. Your exposure to other students is part of your learning process. And I always tell people, you know, the, we don't always advertise it this way, but it's super, super important that when you start college, you do your best to not strictly be defined by your major or your concentration. Um, there's so many reasons as to why they go beyond this panel. Um, the, the key point there is recognizing that you're in an environment where you have the ability to pretty much learn anything in the world. That's the way you got to look at it. And you might choose to pick a topic, study that topic. You might even be exposed research-wise in an area that you're not concentrating or majoring in. That helps to shape perhaps what you want to go do next. So the big thing I would recommend um, that when you think of grad school, because again, I wasn't even thinking of grad school, right? So again, I was figuring out everything as I went along. Uh, I remember a, a colleague friend of mine who was one year older than me, um, his pops told him to think about what he, what he wants to do five years from now. What do you want to do 10 years from now? Keeping in mind that you're going to change your mind, but having that sort of goal of thinking about where you think you want to be in the most holistic fashion, meaning that you want to do a nine to five job, do you want to work on weekends, do you want to bring your work home, do you want to travel a lot, all that's important just to think about it because then that shapes this idea of maybe what you want to do after you graduate from undergrad and decide to pursue a grad school. We take it for granted and when you go from high school to college it's almost mechanical right because you're supposed to right but going beyond that having that deeper understanding of why you think you want to be in grad school is actually what keeps you in grad school right because there's tons of failure right and you have to develop a certain type of uh, mental pugilism when it comes to dealing with that failure but what keeps you going is having the sense of, well, this is how this might line up with my five, 10 year plan. Yeah, sorry for sitting in the back. Um, my name is JP. I'm a second year PhD student from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Go Tar Heels. Yeah. <laughs> but I will preface this by saying I was born and raised in LA, went to a small liberal arts school, uh, Occidental in LA and moved across the country to North Carolina, participating in a lot of DEI work, serving on a lot of committees, and being at Occidental versus UNC, entirely different. 
as you can imagine. <laughs> How have y'all dealt with like administrative pushback as you got um, into your uh, leadership positions? And another question I want to throw at y'all is, how have y'all been thinking about, you know, the affirmative action cases that are that are happening right now as well? I knew I wasn't going to get out of this panel without somebody bringing up the affirmative action case. That's fine. Um, in terms of administrative pushback, uh, so this is more or less where I lean on my science training, right? So I believe in evidence and data. So before I bring forward an idea, I've, I've already done the analysis to say this is the best way for us to get where we need to be based on the data that we have. Um, and so just because you may not be in a scientific STEM space doesn't mean that you can't lean on your training to say, actually, why don't we do a survey? Why don't we look at the quantitative data on that? Why don't we get a sense of what the evidence is, and then let's come to solution to make sure that we're solving the correct problem in the first place. Um, so that's generally my go-to when it comes to um, administrative pushback. Most people in academic leadership, the, the great part about it is they're academics. They respond well to data, right? Like they respond well to evidence. And the idea of what if, what if we just try this thing? And it, even if it fails, we get information about what doesn't work, right? So you get to... Um, sort of appeal to the experimentalist and everyone. Um, in terms of the pending case, um, there there are just a lot of unknowns, right? So um, we're, we are in a space where we are preparing for all possibilities, but we don't know until the decision comes that people spend a lot of time pouring through whatever's written down. Um, that said, um, and the conversations I've been having with some legal scholars, the idea seems to be that the general goal of diversity as an institutional goal is something that's going to be retained. Um, and we already have models for ways to do race neutral emissions, right? So because this has already happened in a variety of states. So we have models for doing this work well and continuing to move forward on our ideals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. All of that depends on exactly what is written down, of course. Um, but it's certainly something that's on my mind every day. <laughs> I think the only thing I'll add about um, pushback is that... Um, you know, again, as a scientist, numbers matter, data matters. But one thing that I've learned in this space is that lived experience matters more to me sometimes, right? Many of us in the room don't show up on a lot of graphs, right? We're often marginalized, minorities, we're small, we've got large error bars, right? And so the data doesn't look clean because we're people, right? It's not going to be clean. We all have a different lived experience. We're all going to show up differently. And so I would say in addition to developing a convincing argument with numbers and statistics, interview people, right? Get quotes, get qualitative data, because that's what matters a lot um, when your N is too small and you can't represent that on a chart. I would add, just tell a story. You just reminded me. People respond really well to stories. So even if you if you have an N of one, but you know this is a problem that needs to be addressed, right? Uh, tell a story. Tell the story of what that one person is experiencing. Most people will then resonate with that story and be open to your idea to address that situation so that no one else experiences that. I think we have time for one more question, one final question. Yeah, this, this is more of a comment about presenting data and suggesting something. To get a no once is not necessarily no. And, you know, I think we need to encourage people to be resilient. You sometimes have to ask and suggest and say several times. And for me, I find that the first time they say no. Second time they say, hmm. Third time they say, well, we're thinking about it. Fourth time they say, oh, that's an idea I had. So if, if that's the way it works, that's okay. Because you still get what you want. And the key to good leadership is letting other people think it's their idea. It's totally fine. The, the point is to make it, make sure it's done. It's not about the credit. 
Well, uh, we are just about out of time, but on that note, uh, we will end. But this has been such a wonderful uh, discussion that I wish we could keep on having and, and, and will continue to have. Um, but with that, uh, I'd like everyone to join me in thanking uh, our three panelists here today. Are we, is that better? Yes. Unfortunately, we had two speakers who couldn't make it to the meeting because of illness. And the first thing that I need to do in this session is to thank Vanessa for agreeing to give the first talk because that wasn't plan A. So she very graciously agreed to be moved up in the schedule and to start <laughs> off our afternoon session. Thank you. Um, so the, the changes in the program are quite small. All of the major components are really um, the same. We're going to start the poster session just a little bit earlier tomorrow. There is an accurate version of the schedule, an up-to-date version. If you go to the, pro to the conference website, um, there's a PDF version that has been updated. Okay, so I apologize, but unfortunately, the programs had already been printed by the time we had to change the schedule. Um, and with that note, it is my pleasure to introduce the session chair for um, these afternoon talks. Sonia Merrill is a faculty member in the Department of Neuroscience here at Brown. And um, I'm even, I'm really delighted to say this, that she was a speaker in the First Neighbor Conference in 2019. So, Sonia. Thank you, everyone. Um, it is it is um, an honor to now get to um, sort of chair a session here at a conference that I attended when I was a postdoctoral fellow. Um, sort of not even on a, the path for a faculty job. I think I that that followed a little bit later, but it's it's been wonderful to be here and um, now to be at uh, the Nibrit, um conference again. So um, again, I guess you've all been already sort of introduced to our first speaker, um, Dr. Vanessa. Um, Mondol, she's currently an associate research scientist um, in the lab of Joan Stites at um, Yale University School of Medicine. Um, and um, she will be speaking about, um, the title of the talk is Elucidating the Roles of Viral Non-Coding RNAs in Latency and Reactivation of an um, Oncogenic Herpes Virus. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much everybody for attending and thank you for the organizers um, for inviting me to speak. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the oncogenic herpes virus called uh, Epstein-Barr virus. So i um, also going to tell you a little bit about the viral non-coding RNAs that are encoded and expressed by this Epstein-Barr virus. And um, my work trying to identify roles uh, for these non-coding RNAs in order to regulate uh, lytic reactivation of the virus. So... Epstein-Barr virus is a widespread oncogenic herpes virus. And what that means is 95% of people on the planet Earth are infected with this as we speak. Um, normally, it exists latently, so people aren't symptomatic, uh, although it can cause infectious mononucleosis during primary infection. Um, but then after that, for most people, it's fine. For some immune-compromised people, however, it's highly associated with B cell lymphomas, um, including Burkitt's lymphoma and other nasopharyngeal cancers. Um, and even more recently, it's been implicated with uh, multiple sclerosis. <clears throat> it's um, a 170 kilobase double stranded DNA virus, um, and there are over 85 or about 85 ORFs. Uh, interestingly enough, though, um, so you can't see this here, but um, most of those ORFs are not expressed during latency. In fact, it's not until um, the viral replication is induced um, that early lytic genes get activated, and these tend to be transcription factors and that sort of thing, and uh, polymerases, viral polymerases that are important for DNA replication. Uh, and then late lytic genes are turned on, and these tend to be um, genes involved in the virion packaging, and, um, and so that's what it happens. Um, but despite uh, all of these ORFs being turned off during latency, um, 
there's actually viral non-coding RNAs that are highly expressed throughout the entire EBV life cycle. Um, so colored here, so in the squares are where the different ORFs that uh, at max are um, being expressed during latency, but the colored, the different colored uh, annotations represent different uh, non-coding RNAs that are expressed. Um, and they're very highly expressed as well. Um, so when people think of RNA, you know, uh, when we think of, uh, you know, we like to go back to the central dogma of molecular biology. And that is that DNA genes are transcribed into messenger RNAs that are then translated into proteins. However, non-coding RNAs actually make up important parts of all uh, cellular pathways. So for example, the best known ribonucleoprotein uh, is the ribosome. So pictured here is the 70S ribosome, which is actually made up of mostly ribosomal RNAs that don't encode proteins, but in fact serves as a scaffold for different ribosomal proteins. Um, and this is, you know, important for translation. Um, uh, uh, Non-coding RNAs can also regulate DNA transcription. So uh, one good example of this is the exist long non-coding RNA, which is important for exon activation. Um, and RNAs, non-coding RNAs, can also regulate itself. So the best known mechanism of that is the microRNAs, which can bind three prime untranslated regions and lead to uh, either degradation of the mRNA target or uh, translational repression, uh, leading to less expression of the protein. And so given that these non-coding RNAs are really highly expressed, we ask, you know, why are these non-coding RNAs and EBV expressed so highly during latency? Um, and does that mean that they're contributing to maintaining that latency? And uh, could they be regulating uh, the switch to lytic reactivation? Um, and then, so to kind of tackle that question, we asked, how does the total RNA interactome differ in latent and lytic infected cells? So I carried out this technique called PARIS, which was developed in Howard Chang's lab. And it's basically a high throughput sequencing method uh, to look at RNA-RNA interactions. So you use the Sorlin chemical in live cells, and this Sorlin chemical will cross-link uh, RNAs together. And then you kind of proximity, you use proximity ligation um, to make an RNA duplex where the target is now bound to, or is now one molecule with the, um, with the targeting uh, RNA. And so then you sequence this, um, this RNA duplex and you end up with either intramolecular interactions, which can give you insight into secondary structure of the RNA, or intermolecular interactions, which can basically tell you, um, you know, what RNA is interacting with another RNA. So I did this in both latent and lytic cells. And um, so this is just a, uh, uh, what the EBV genome, some of the genes that are expressed. And each one of these arch, arches represents a different RNA-RNA interaction um, that we identified using Paris. Um, and so a couple of things to note um, is uh, this space here where no interactions are present is actually a deletion in the strain that I'm using. So that's a good sanity check that I'm not just sequencing garbage. Um, and then uh, the, there are other things that we're able to see too. For example, the secondary structure of mallet one the secondary structure of vault RNAs. These are well-defined uh, non-coding RNAs. Um, that are, have been well characterized and we were able to see those interactions appear in the data. Um, but we decided to follow up on these microRNAs because it seemed like there was a lot of interactions coming from these uh, Epstein-Barr virus microRNAs. So I briefly mentioned that microRNAs are small. Uh, they're about 22 nucleotide long RNAs that bind, um, that serve as guides 
for the mirror risk complex, and mirror risk stands for microRNA induced silencing complex. And the main effect of protein in that complex is argonaut. Um, and so uh, the microRNA serves as a guide for argonaut as part of mirror risk to bind to the three prime UTR of messenger RNAs and either promote uh, deadenylation and de degradation or just block translation. <clears throat> and so EBV microRNAs were actually the first viral microRNAs that were identified. Um, there's about 22 that are encoded in the genome, which are blocked here by the captions. I'm sorry about that. But, um, and so previous work in the lab um, had done what's known as a hits clip experiment, which is a high throughput um, sequencing, cross-linking and immunoprecipitation of uh, Argonaut in order to look for um, different microRNA targets. And they found several EBV microRNAs competing for host uh, messenger RNA targets, which tended to be um, related to immune genes. However, none of the uh, interactions that I saw in, within the EBV genome were found. And so if I do a survey of all of the microRNAs uh, identified in these infected cells, and this is just by doing small RNA sequencing of latent and lytic cells, you can see that they actually make up, even though there's only 22 of them, um, like 10 to 20% of all of the small RNAs that are expressed in the cells. So that's actually a lot. Because um, the total human microRNA population, for example, is about 600 um, total human microRNAs that are expressed in these cells. So these 22 uh, are making up 20%. And, and so they must have an important function. What could that be? Um, we can also see that after lytic induction, there's huge changes in the microRNA population. So looking here, this is um, average counts per million. And on this side, we can see average log twofold change after lytic induction. And so that, that means after lytic induction, um, things that go up this way are going up a lot and things that go down are actually going down a lot. Um, and we can see this, we can validate this using a northern blot. So northern blots um, probe for the exact sequence of the microRNA that you're interested in. And we can see after lytic induction, um, several microRNAs go down, some of them go up, and some of them don't change at all. Um, so some of the uh, example microRNA and mRNA interactions that we found that we thought were really interesting um, was, for example, this one here, this EBV mir BART20 binding to BZLF1. So BZLF1, oh man, okay. BZLF1 um, is actually an uh, immediate early um, transcription factor important for lytic reactivation. So we thought it was a really good um, example of these small RNAs um, being able to um, regulate um, lytic reactivation. Uh, sorry. Um, she just told me I have two minutes left, so now I, how do I... Oh. Yeah, now I'm skipping a bunch of slides because I only have two minutes left. Um, okay, so let me go back a little bit. Um, okay, so some other things that we found to um, so there's an EBER2 non-coding RNA that's really important, and um, they're expressed about a million copies per cell in infected cells. And so we know that uh, it works with a host transcription factor, PAX5, in order to regulate, um, um, to maintain latency by, uh, by regulating transcription of a latent membrane protein that's uh, present in the terminal repeat region of the virus. Um, but this interaction was indirect. And instead I found a long non-coding RNA that could be binding EBER2. And it seems to be regulating that uh, process of latency. Um, the binding region we found of uh, that long non-coding RNA to EBER2 seems to be conserved in um, similar uh, herpes viruses. Um, if we do an anti-PAX5 immunoprecipitation and look for 
the eBRA binding site, we can see that it's there, it's present. Um, okay, and um, if we do in vitro assays, looking at whether or not BFRT10 can bind to eBRA2, we can see that it's binding. Um, but yeah, so we've got a lot of experiments that we've done. Sorry that I have to skip. I swear, I did this practice talk and, and I had like more, I only went like 11 minutes and I was like, oh, I'll add more slides. Of course, so this is what happened, sorry. Um, okay, so um, basically in conclusion, the EBRA2 BFRT10 TR interaction can potentially be very important for the latent analytic viral states. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to talk a little bit more about the EBRA2 secondary structure, which we have evidence to show that it changes after lytic reactivation. And I've actually done some um, experiments now that show that the proteins, there are different proteins that are actually interacting after lytic reactivation. And so we're following up on that using mass spec. And um, EBV microRNAs, uh, I hope you can appreciate that they regulate their EBV transcripts of both in latency and after lytic reactivation. And that's work that I've done with an undergrad mostly. The undergrad actually did most of the work that I didn't get to show you, which is a shame because I, I actually, you know, wanted to promote her work a little bit, Sharon Lee. Um, so acknowledgements to the Joan Stites lab. Where's Joan? There she is. There's Joan and Casio is still there for those of you who know Joan. Um, Teresa's still there too. And everybody else in the picture has changed because we haven't taken a new lab picture since COVID, clearly. Um, thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so so if they're if the microRNAs are regulating, you know, so this transcript that started with B, which I can't remember the name of, and, and also Eber 2 So how is that modulated? Um, so so if they're if they're if they're bound and that's helping keep them keep keep the latency going, what is the trigger that would potentially Yeah, so um, so the BFRT ten Eber 2 interaction, we found BFRT ten also interacts with the terminal repeat region and we believe that it serves as a scaffold to help bring the different proteins over to that region. And so I mentioned kind of briefly doing mass spec because what we really want to do is just kind of finalize that complex. And we think that that's really what's kind of helping keep um, latency in check. Yes? Are these microRNAs specific to EBV? Or do they occur in other viruses or animals? <laughs> yeah, so there are, um, so there's another virus, uh, Carposi sarcoma herpes virus, and they also have um, K KSHV microRNAs that are expressed. And some of those targets are the same as the EBV targets in terms of host targets, because they both want to kind of mess with the immune system. Um, but otherwise there's, um, uh, not many examples of viral microRNAs. All right. There's actually no more time for questions. So we got to move on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so our, our next speaker um, um, is David Anaguano. He's a, currently a graduate student in the Department of Cellular Biology at the University of Georgia in the lab of Vasant Merle Dikaran. Um, and his talk is titled Plasmodium falciparum requires two ROP trees to invade host red blood cells. Um, okay. <laughs> First, uh, I wanted to thank the organizers for allowing me to present my work. Um, thanks for the introduction. And I just realized that this is the first time I'm going to give this talk to a non parasitology audience. So let's see how it goes. Um, so, well, uh, as probably we all know, malaria, it's still a major public health issue with around 4 billion people in endemic regions in risk of, of contracting the disease. And interestingly, uh, malaria is also one of the leading causes of childhood mortality around the world. And when we switch um, the focus to uh, the African continent, we see it becomes the leading cause of childhood mortality. 
So this is just to uh, reiterate that malaria is still uh, a big problem. Um, so malaria is caused by different species of, of plasmodium, being plasmodium falciparum, the deadliest and the most widely distributed. So the life cycle of plasmodium goes between two um, hosts, the mosquito and also the human host. Um, during this uh, whole life cycle, basically they uh, develop into different forms, complex forms that I'm not going to go deep into it. But uh, at the Moralira lab, we're specifically interested in the intraitrocytic life cycle, which is the life cycle within the red blood cells. Why are we interested here? Because um, basically this cycle is what causes the symptoms of malaria, which includes fever, chills, and, and others. So um, the life cycle, shortly, uh, the way it happens is when a merosoid, which is uh, this tiny invasive form, uh, um, invades a red blood cell, and it develops into a growing form known as rings, which is because of the shape. Um, can I point? Okay. Uh, because of the shape, and then they they further oh sorry, they further develop into trophozoites, which are the uh, ex, um, the metabolically active form, and then finally they develop into their replicative form, uh, which is known as schizons. Uh, and then finally, this um, schizons they uh, burst the red blood cell, and they uh, egress and the um, these merosoids that are egress now, they now invade a red blood cell and the cycle starts again. Uh, and now, today, I'm going to talk to you, uh, focus uh, specifically on invasion, uh, which is very essential for the invasion, um, for the infection. So the way invasion happens, uh, surely it's that the merosoid, which is this infecting form, uh, it uh, recognizes a red blood cell and initiates an early attachment based on um, interaction between receptors on the red blood cell and ligand from the parasite. Then the parasite basically uh, makes a pore in the red blood cell membrane and it starts injecting proteins. So these proteins are basically uh, uh, localized in different uh, secretory organelles in the parasite. And today I'm gonna focus mainly on this uh, couple, this pair of uh, secretory organelles known as ruptures which these are these um, bulb-shaped organelles, uh, sorry, uh, club-shaped organelles, uh, which are divided into two main regions, the neck and the bulb, because of their shape. And, um, and basically, going, going back to the invasion, um, uh, proteins from these um, from these rub trees, they are uh, injected into red blood cell membrane, they form what is called a run complex, and this leads to the formation of a tight junction, which basically seals the, uh, the um, union between the uh, merosoid and the red blood cell, and then they secrete proteins from the rub trees into the red blood cell cytoplasm. Finally, um, the process, uh, basically the uh, merosoid uses its actinizing motor to pull the red blood cell membrane around themselves to form the parasitophorous vacuole, which is the, uh, the space where they're going to reside, and to finalize with internalization. Something uh, I wanted to mention is the role that calcium plays. Well, calcium is known to be essential for uh, invasion. However, nothing is known about what's the role or what uh, calcium is triggering during this process. Um, our lab has had a long interest in the study of calcium binding proteins, and that's how I ended up um, working with this protein, which is rub neck protein 11. Um, I got interested because of two main features. Basically, it has seven transmembrane domains and uh, calcium binding domain. Uh, which is localized to the cytoplasmic uh, side of the of the merosoid. Also, this protein it's very conserved among other Plasmodium species first, and other AP complexants such as uh, Toxoplasma gondii and Cryptosporidium. Nothing is known about the role of this protein in other um, AP complexants. Um, in, in in order to dissect the role of this protein in Plasmodium falciparum. What I use, I use, I use an approach of designing a conditional knockdown. Um, we use CRISPR-Cas9 to generate a conditional knockdown, which is based, uh, which is what we call tetr dosi. The way the system works is that um, we basically introduce a set of aptamers at the C-terminal of the protein of interest, and also we also express a TED repressor, which is going to bind to this aptamer. In the presence of a molecule, uh, molecule of uh, inhydrate tetracycline, or ATC, um, this uh, molecule binds the TED repressor and it, it blocks the binding. But when we remove ATC from the media, uh, the TED repressor binds the aptamer and then physically blocks translation. So um, I created my, my parasite line and then I checked on, okay, let's see, oh, sorry. Um, 
well, you can build it. But um, the first thing is, okay, is this uh, protein, uh, the lack of protein is doing something in my parasite? Yeah, like you can see in the presence of ATC or the presence of RON11, the parasites grow normally, but in the absence of RON11, the parasites do not grow past the first life cycle. So the next question was like, um, so what's happening? What's going on with the uh, phenotype on my parasites? So um, what I observed, I tracked the development of the parasites during two life cycles, and I observed that um, initially the parasites in the presence or absence of RON11, they grow normally into rings, trophozoids, chisons. I also observed that they can egress normally, but in the last step, I realized that after a couple hours in the absence of RON11, the parasites, instead of forming rings, they, uh, well, I observed is an accumulation of merosoids surrounding the red blood cells, which suggested that this is an uh, invasion phenotype, an invasion defect. So obviously the, the obvious question was like, what is the role of RON11 during invasion? So I decided to uh, follow um, and see if I can determine the participation of RON11 in two steps, which is attachment and the uh, secretion of ruptured proteins. To do this, I designed an assay based on the use of uh, cytokalizing D. Cytokalizing D is an acting um, polymerization inhibitor, which basically blocks the uh, this motor that the merosoids have in blocks uh, internalization, but it doesn't affect the previous step of invasion. So using this assay, I measured the number of attached merosoids uh, in the presence or absence of RON11, and I didn't see any significant difference. And also using the same assay, um, I observed the secretion of proteins from the rub trees. This is RUP1, is a protein from the rub tree bulb that we know it's secreted into the rub cell uh, uh, cytoplasm. And as you can observe, in the presence of RON11, obviously you see secretion, but also in the absence of RON11, we also see secretion. So um, in this way, uh, I was able to determine that RON11 is not required for merosoid attachment nor rupture discharge. So the next question that I had was, um, so are ruptures affected by RON11 knockdown? So uh, sadly, because of the uh, resolution that you can get, well, first, these are micron-sized um, um, cells. And by the resolution you can get from normal confocal, um, I was not able to see the structure of the rub trees. So, uh, but thankfully, I was able to get my hands on this really cool technique, which is called expansion microscopy, which is based on the use of a hydrogel, which in the presence of water, is just um, expands in size uh, around like 4.5 times. And with that, also the size of the, of the sample that we're using. So combining this expansion microscopy, and uh, the use of this stain, staining, uh, which is uh, this uh, molecule MHS <coughs> ester, which is a general protein stainer that basically stains every protein, I was able to see uh, uh, the, the, stru the structures of the ruptures, which I was not able to see using regular uh, microscopy. As you can see, um, which is the, I'm trying to point. Okay, yes. As you can see here, uh, I was able to observe the, uh, the structure of the rub trees uh, with the rub tree ball, the rub tree neck, and also uh, another structure which is called the apical ring. I observed that this also on um, egress merosoids, as you can see here. But the interesting part came when I was looking at my, my knockdown parasite. Um, what I found is that in the absence of RON11, I ended up with fully developed merosoids that had a single rub tree. And as you can see here, the rub tree seems to have a normal uh, bulb, a normal neck, and also the apical ring, but we only had a single rub tree. Uh, I also observed this in egress merosoids. So they, the structures look fine, in the, but they still have a single rub tree. Um, the next thing I did was check, okay, is there, are there other proteins being affected by this uh, single rub tree phenotype? Um, sorry, it's backwards. Um, so um, I check one of these proteins, RUP1, which is localized to the, um, to the rupture ball. As you can see here, there is only a single rupture, but the protein is normally localized where it should go. And when I look at a, at a protein from the rupture neck, um, just this part, I also observe that in the absence of RON11, it localizes normally. Um, another part of the work that is not shown here, I also quantify by Western blood the amount of protein, and I observe a reduction of about 50%, which is kind of like expected. Um, and then finally, um, my question was like, what is the role of RON11 uh, Ro in rupture biogenesis? Because we know uh, I, I'm, I'm ended up with a single rupture, um, single rupture merosoids. So to do this, I'm just gonna briefly uh, go over um, how these uh, parasites go from uh, a single parasite into 10 to 30 uh, in numbers. 
and the way they do it is basically they uh, they do a, uh, different rounds of, of mitosis, um, which you know it starts with a single nuclei, divides into two, and then it starts something that is very particular for plasmodium, which is they start a series of mitoses that are asynchronous in different times. Um, they start dividing at different times. And what it's uh, really interesting is that we can, uh, during this uh, series of mitosis, this is where the ruptures are formed, and we can also, uh, that's where they start dividing too. And at the end, when the parasites decide, okay, we have enough numbers, um, they start something what is called segmentation, and it start forming the actual merozoites. And, and basically you can see they start forming using this uh, guiding, which is called the basal complex. Uh, and it starts leading the formation of the merozoites, and then they ended up with the merozoites. Um, interestingly, we were able to, um, using expansion microscopy too, uh, uh, we were able to track this uh, biogenesis of the rub trees uh, using this combination of the staining of the um, of this uh, thing of this uh, complex, which is the the MTOC complex, the microtubule organization center. So, um, yeah, um, sorry. I'm just gonna go over quick. So I was able to track the um, the formation during early schizogony and during late schizogony, and I was um, at the at the last point basically. Um, I was able to track the formation. And my last um, slide is that uh, what I found is that in the absence of my protein, what it's affect being affected is the last step, which is the formation, the segregation of the last rub tree into um, the merozoid. And because in the absence of my protein, I observed that uh, instead of two rub trees being, seg being segregated, there is only one rub tree that is being segregated. And with this, um, um, and the conclusions that uh, hopefully by now I have convinced you that uh, in the absence of wrong 11, we ended up with merozoids with a single rub tree, that these merozoids are capable of attachment, secretion of proteins, but they are not capable of internalizing. And finally, that in the absence of uh, wrong 11, what I think that it's happening is that there's the novel formation step where the second rupture is being formed during the last uh, the segregation event. It's not happening. And that's why I ended up with uh, single rupture merosoids. And with that, I want to thank everyone in my lab and especially the Absalom lab at um, Indiana University because uh, that's where I did most of the work with uh, expansion microscopy. So thank you. Um, so I was wondering if you know uh, in Toxo what happens if, if anyone has studied RON11 knockout since uh, rock trees have been most studied yeah. in Toxo invasion? It's interestingly, this is it's not published, it's pub if we're not published, but uh, by talking to um, people that has worked in Toxo, they have told me that they tried to do knockdowns or knockouts and they didn't see any phenotype. But also interestingly in Toxoplasma, um, Toxoplasma has around uh, six to eight rock trees and only uses two of them to invade. Um, yeah, it's very particular. Um, Plasmodium has two rub trees and another AP complex and um, like Cryptosporidium, they only have one, a single rub tree and that is um, enough to invade, so. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So our final speaker of the day is um, Dr. Moses Levins. He is currently an assistant professor at the McLaughlin Research Institute for Biomedical Sciences in Great Falls, Montana. Um, and his talk is titled, A Sensitive and Selective Superoxide Dismutase One Real-Time Quaking-Induced Conversion Assay for Amatrophic Lateral Sclerosis. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be here, and thank you for the invitation. It's been a long uh, long plane ride yesterday, about <laughs> 2,500 miles, so uh, bear with me. Um, I started working on this project a couple of years ago uh, during my postdoc, and um, we're continuing uh, with this assay today in my uh, small laboratory. <clears throat> So ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, 
named after the uh, Yankee baseball player who got the disease and died from it in his early 40s, is a motor system neurodegenerative disease that uh, is rapidly progressive. And um, as the disease progresses, the motor neurons um, end up dying. And what ends up happening to a patient um, upon diagnosis, which takes about one year, uh, the, the disease is thought to start focally and, and spread. And as it spreads, um, what happens uh, during uh, disease progression is the patients uh, lose the ability to innervate muscle. And as a consequence, they typically die from respiratory failure. This is just showing some of the proteins involved in ALS and some of the staining um, from a famous uh, ALS review article. Ninety percent of ALS is sporadic. Um, the cause uh, to be safe is probably unknown. Uh, there's some interesting risk factors out there for the disease. Uh, about 10% of ALS is inherited um, or familial. And the common inherited form of ALS is the abnormal hexanucleotide repeat expansion in the intronic region of a gene called C9ORF72, which encodes the GTPase normally. Uh, the other uh, uh, mutation or familial form of ALS is uh, an enzyme called superoxide dismutase 1. It's about 2% of uh, all ALS. About 1 in 500 deaths are from ALS, uh, suggesting based on our world population of late last year about 8 billion that if you do the math, it suggests about 16 million people living today are going to die from the disease. Like all neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, um, they're expected to increase. And the primary reason is aging. People are living longer and our world is getting more populated. Uh, to date, I only know of one paper um, looking at TDP43 seeding. Uh, for ALS, but there are little biomarkers that can detect these protein seeds that are thought to maybe spread in patients. A little bit about the protein uh, we're studying, human superoxide dismutase 1. It's a metalloprotein that binds copper and zinc, and it uses copper for catalysis. And what it does, one of its functions is to take superoxide and break it down into molecular oxygen and hydrogen peroxide uh, through a two-step reaction mechanism. SOD1 normally is a homodimeric protein that, as I mentioned, binds copper, uh, shown here in orange, and zinc in blue. And it's a homodimeric protein to carry out this function. Um, highlighted here in the top of figure A is uh, purple, which is the zinc binding loop shown here. And yellow is, is known as the electrostatic loop. And green is the disulfide bond um, that helps with the uh, uh, dimer formation. Uh, in B is the native structure of SOD1. And highlighted in red is all the autosomal dominant mutations in patients uh, in the SOD1 gene. So they're all over the structure. Um, in C is post-translational modifications of the enzyme, and it's thought that demetallation and or loss of this important disulfide bridge is responsible for some of the misfolding of SOD1 in ALS. Real-time quaking-induced conversion assay is a method that uh, we work, we um, do experiments with, and basically um, it's like PCR, uh, but instead of amplifying nucleic acid, you're uh, amplifying misfolded protein. And so the way this works is it was initially established in prion diseases. Um, and so you have uh, infected uh, brain or spinal fluid, 
um, other tissues uh, from a patient or from an animal. And what you do is you homogenize the tissue and inside the tissue homogenate is thought to be uh, the infectious material. In this case, it's showing prion, but this could be tau, this could be amyloid beta, this could be TDP43, this could be SOD1. Um, any misfolded protein that might be involved in some uh, human disease. And what you do is you homogenize the tissue where you suspect that there's misfolding and you grow recombinant protein, um, oftentimes out of Escherichia E. coli, and you purify it, and we call this substrate. And so this is really important for the assay because if the substrate's not treated correctly or it might be too unstable or too stable, um, this method's not going to work. And we found that out with developing the sod assay. And so... Uh, you have your substrate, you have your infectious tissue, and then you have a specific buffer that's super important to get this assay to work. And for detection, we use the amyloid binding dithioflavin T. And so what happens is you make up your buffer, your recombinant substrate with thioflavin T and multi-channel pipette, and you put it in a 96 well plate, and then you go and seed the wells at specific tissue dilutions. And what you're looking for, um, once you put it in the microplate reader, um, and then we run a program that shakes, collects, collects data, and then it goes through a shaking cycle, rests, collects data. So we're looking at um, fluorescence emission of thioflavin T at 485 nanometers. And so what happens is if the tissue has the misfolded protein, um, you will see propagation or amplification, and that's shown here on the y-axis with THT fluorescence. And we usually start at like 10 to the minus two. We make a 10% tissue homogenate and then we dilute out tenfold. And so what you end up getting is fluorescence at different tissue dilutions. And as a negative control, um, that tissue should not have the seeds in it. So it should be THT negative. So RT-quick assays have been established as diagnostic biomarkers for neurodegenerative diseases. This started with prion diseases, diagnosing people with creutzfeldt jakob disease, um, which is super rare, like one in a million people get CJD. Uh, Parkinson's disease with uh, alpha-synuclein. And currently there is not uh, really, um, as I mentioned, a biomarker that works for ALS using RT-quick. So, we are looking at ALS patient spinal cords with different types of ALS uh, using a SOD1 substrate. And this work was done by Justin uh, Milky. He's the only person I have in the lab. <laughs> so we got a lab of like uh, one person and me sometimes. So it's about 1.5 people uh, doing experiments here. So bear with us. This took us a while to figure out. So in this figure, uh, what you're looking at is thioflavin T fluorescence on the y-axis over time. And negative controls are shown here uh, in dark out to about 160 hours. And all the ALS patients, uh, we have two sporadic ALS patients. One is in cyan and one is in purple. And as a positive control, this is a patient with a SOD1 mutation. Uh, shown here in orange, and as you can see, they are all coming up at 10 to the minus 3 spinal cord dilution. Uh, so in RT-Quick, we talk about sensitivity and specificity. So this is raw data. So how many wells are THT positive? How many are uh, negative? And so in this case, all the wells are coming up with the patient uh, spinal cords. Interestingly, we're also getting uh, SOD1 seeding in C9 ORF72 patient spinal cords. So these are two uh, patients shown here in pink and one in green. And um, we're also detecting that, although we have some evidence there might be less seeding than the other kinds of ALS. So diluting out, uh, we can currently get out to uh, 100,000 uh, spinal cord tissue dilution and still pick up SOD1 seeding. And so this is in uh, SOD1 falls, shown here in blue, and sporadic ALS, shown here in green. And just as confirmation that we're getting fibrils, when the plate's done running, we scrape the wells, and then we image, 
And so these are five rolls from a SOD1 familial ALS patient, from a SALS patient, and then negative control, which we see a little, but that's probably because the negatives start coming up late, which is typical for RT quick. So conclusions and future directions, uh, SOD1 seating is detected in ALS patient spinal cords, importantly with different types of ALS, with high sensitivity and specificity, out to 10 to the minus five using our quick assay. So this leads to our hypothesis that misfolded SOD1 is a biomarker for this disease. And so we got our first grant for the lab, a little seed grant. Um, so we're gonna uh, be looking at ALS mice as a function of disease progression. And the hypothesis being that as the disease uh, progresses that SOD1 seeding is gonna increase. And then also uh, looking at the spinal fluid of patients and importantly, uh, we think that this might be something outside of ALS that might be occurring in other neurodegenerative diseases. So acknowledgements, uh, if you've never been to Montana, I encourage you to come visit. Uh, we're not all crazy like you've probably seen in the news. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I'd like to acknowledge Neil, uh, Neil and Byron. Byron was my uh, postdoc advisor at NIH and Neil is a physician ALS physician uh, who provided the tissue, as well as the target ALS providing negative control spinal cords. And also uh, the McLaughlin Research Institute uh, for lab startup funding that provided equipment. And I'd also like to acknowledge my family um, who's been very supportive. As you know, doing science, it's not easy. So with that, I'll take some questions. Questions? Oh, go ahead. In the back, sorry. In the back. Um, are you only looking at wild type sod? And I, do you have interest in looking at the the familiar familial mutants? Uh, they're they're in there. The the data. Uh, yeah, I showed that in the graph. Um, nope, no worries. Maybe I didn't uh, talk about it well. Yeah. So the orange is a positive control sod one falls patient. Yep. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, that was really, really interesting. Can I ask a question about this method? So if I understand uh, the approach, you're using this method on this particular protein, SOD1, it's of interest for all the reasons you explained. Have you or do you know have other use, use, others use this technique as a screen in a sort of a candidate agnostic method on a total protein purification to see which proteins are capable of this behavior? Do you think that would be possible if this hasn't been done before? Like a drug screening? Um, or, or even like a screen for proteins, which one of you can exhibit this behavior, this prion-like behavior? Yeah, so that kind of gets, hits back to the third point of my uh, conclusion. So we're gonna use this assay um, to look at um, Parkinson's disease. So we have a little bit of data, I don't have it with me, um, but we have a little bit of data that misfolded SOD is in the brain of PD patients. So, and PD and ALS are movement disorders. And so um, there's only a small number of papers actually that have been published on looking at misfolded SOD1 in Parkinson's. Um, there's less than 10 papers. And I think they're mostly coming out of the labs in Australia, like Ben Trist et al. So yeah, that's something for like a future Actually, I wrote a grant on it. Uh, we don't know the funding for it, though, till like September or something. But yeah, let's see. Yeah. Is the GTPase, the only protein, uh, also misfolding, or is it something specific to SOD? Yeah, to be honest with you, um, I don't know much about C9 or 72 familial ALS, but I have read that it encodes a GTPase. But I think the abnormal hexanucleotide repeat expansions, I think it's GGGCCC, that are in that gene cause some like dipeptide uh, toxic, toxicity like to the cell. And so I think that's sort of more of the, you know, the pathophysiology of that form of ALS. Yeah. All right, I think that's all we, the time we have, or do we have time for more questions? Yeah, we can? Okay, wonderful. Yay. We can. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was surprised by the time that it would take that long to 
at least to detect the, the misfolding. Do you have an explanation or understanding, or does that tell you something about the process? Yeah, so it's pretty common actually um, for RT quick not to see, so we call it lag phase. So, you know, you're seeing stuff come up like 40 to 80 hours somewhere in there. And um, I think a couple of things. One reason is the substrate we're using is pretty stable. So you have to do things to it to get it to uh, for the seed to actually recognize it and then start propagating it. Um, so we've done a little, a lot actually of careful analysis of, OK, what's required for preparation and what do we have to do to it? And it ties back into post -tra post translational modifications to sod one. Because once it starts, it really skyrockets. Yeah, it goes exponential, um, and you see that in any RT quick papers. Like there's a tau quick, although they haven't got it working. I don't think in anti mortem tissue, but um, but it's pretty common. But I think it goes. What I'm saying is it goes back to protein stability. So like synuclein is not as stable as sod one. So the leg phase is typically shorter. You start seeing propagation earlier. So it ties back into like the thermodynamics of folding for the protein that you're look that you're trying to target, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Another question? Okay, one more question. I'll yeah. take it in the back. You've had your hat up <laughs> the whole time, so please. Um, um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my kind of a quick question. So at the end, you talk about um, developing this further as a diagnostic biomarker detection method. Do you think like it could also help? Uh, so like this kind of research could help um, ultimately for kind of, like like for therapeutic purposes, like having identified sod one not just in some other ALS, but yeah. also in other types. I think it's uh, and it's just a guess at this point, but I think this could be directly tied into antisense oligonucleotide therapy for neurodegenerative diseases. So there's a ASO for SOD1 ALS that just got approved by the FDA. Um, although someone like me, like trying to get an ASO is probably pretty difficult. Like, I don't think a company is just going to be like, yeah, we'll get you one. Um, <laughs> But so pharmacodynamic, yeah, I think there will be, if you have the right drug, there will probably be a response, i.e. less seeding. Yep. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.